Uh, we have uh, Vice Mayor Tomei that's gonna be remote. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the Public Safety, uh, Public Safety Finance Strategic Support Committee uh, for the day of uh, October 19th, 2023. Before we get started, let me just read a few, uh, make a few comments. Uh, before we begin, I wanna remind the Public Safety Finance and Strate Strategic Support Committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members, or staff. All members of the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee staff and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct which will disturb, disrupt, disrupt or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in the removal from the meeting. This meeting of the Public Safety Finance Strategic Support Committee will now come to order. Can the clerk's office please call the roll? Batra. Present. Torres. Present. Kame. She's on Zoom. Can we see her online? Pre present. Uh, I am in Monterey to attend the Cal LAFCO conference in my capacity as a Santa Clara LAFCO commissioner. I am alone in the hotel room. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know. Okay. I think. Next we have Duan. I could have stated that. Everything present. Is. And Jimenez. Oh, present. Of Thank course. you. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to item B, which is a review of the work plan. And I want to point out a few things. There's about five items on the review of the work plan. And because these are um, thought to be very routine, we're going to take one action for approval and one uh, round of public comments on this particular item. So. I'll entertain, actually we'll go to public comment first on, on the review of the work plan. Again, not for each individual item, but as a set of items. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I'll be allowed two minutes to speak. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to simply speak on items uh, three and four. I'll try to be short. Um, about recruitment ideas, uh, and language accessibility. Um, both of these items are being placed on a future agenda, uh, deferred, I guess. Um, for the uh, language accessibility, uh, that had a, a date of February to return to uh, either this committee or council someplace, maybe we even rules and up on government. Thank you. I think this is a really interesting item. Uh, boy, I'm really excited by this item, what exactly that can, uh, be for ourselves. So good luck in how it, when it will return in February 2024. With uh, item three, recruitment and hiring, that didn't have a return due date, which I was a bit surprised about. It simply uh, it would be good practices to, to, to be able to do that. I know we're having issues, uh, problems into how to better address recruitment. I think with the fentanyl issues, we have to really return to the ideas of reimagine as how to consider recruitment and as part of our overall good practices. Um, to, to involve ideas of reimagine in the recruitment process, uh, that's creativity, that's working towards our future community. Uh, I think that's the real focus on how to, how to address recruitment. Good luck in working in that direction and understanding those concepts uh, and how we're building the future of police and community. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Blair. We had one public speaker card and it says San Jose PD cannabis regulations. I see that on B2 and D. Um, also yeah, on I think that would be more appropriate for when the item comes For the next forward. one? Okay. Yeah. And then back to the committee. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, if there are any questions of the committee members on review of the work plan, or if not, then I'd entertain a motion for approval of item one through five. No, I, well, motion. <laughs> you move. And then, so move. Yeah, second. second. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry if I meant that I was making a motion. Okay, there's a motion and a second. We'll vote. Batra. Yes. Torres? Yay. Kame? Yes, and I'm alone. <laughs> Duan? Yes. And Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Um, we'll, we'll move on to uh, the consent calendar, which is item C. Uh, on that, we have the bi-monthly financial report for July, August 2023. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a report, so uh, if any questions, or, or actually, Go to public comment first before we come back to the committee. No public comments. Back to the committee. 
Okay, so entertain a motion to uh, approve. If motion, I move to approve. Okay, motion to approve, is there a second? Second. All right, wonderful. Motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and vote. Batra? Yes. Torres? Yes, and there's a whole lot of people in this room. <laughs> Kame? Yes, and I'm alone. <laughs> Duan? Yes. And Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. All right, wonderful. We're going to now go into the, the meat of the meeting, which is the item D, reports to committee. First, we have the fire department staffing, recruitment, hiring, bilingual services annual report. Uh, we'll go ahead and take the uh, report, then we'll go to public comment, then back to the committee. I know we have uh, Chief Sapien and, uh, and, and Assistant Fire Chief James Williams. Welcome, sir. Please go ahead. Chairperson Jimenez, uh, members of the committee, uh, James Williams, Assistant Fire Chief with the San Jose Fire Department. Uh, very happy today to present the Fire Department Staffing, Recruitment, Hiring, and Bilingual Services Annual Report. Um, as background, the San Jose Fire Department mission is to protect lives, property, and the environment through prevention and response. We are an all-hazard response agency spanning across 208 square miles, including uh, 181 uh, square miles within the city and an additional 26.81 square miles of area service by agreement between the Santa Clara Central Fire Protection District and the City of San Jose, providing timely and effective response uh, services to the community. Assistant, Assistant Chief uh, Williams, I apologize for the interruption. Could you mind moving the mic uh, a little closer? Yeah, just because the sound isn't all that great up here. Thank you. Thank is that you better? Sir. Yes. Okay, thanks. Much better. In fiscal year 22-23, the department responded to over 109,000 incidents, a 6% increase compared to the last report to the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee. To provide some historical content, the department reached its highest staffing levels in fiscal year 2007-2008 with 758 authorized positions, uh, but experienced a dramatic reduction to meet budgetary requirements during the Great Recession. In 2011-2012, the department eliminated 75 sworn positions, which resulted in the closure of fire uh, department. Uh, thank you, Chief. I'm talking without advancing the slides. My apologies. Uh, to provide some historical content, the department reached its highest staffing levels in fiscal year 2007, and uh, which was at, excuse me, uh, fiscal year 2007, 2008, with 758 authorized sworn positions, but experienced a dramatic reduction to meet budgetary requirements during the Great Recession. In 2011-2012, the department eliminated 75 sworn positions, which resulted in the closure of fire engines 30, 33, 34, 35, truck 3 and hit 29, uh, 4 personnel, and then 2 on the hit, uh, 4 on all the other uh, apparatus. Since then, the department uh, diligently uh, explored opportunities to restore staffing levels to keep pace with the increase in emergency response, uh, and that has uh, happened over, over the last several years. Uh, in San Jose, the daily minimum staffing level requires 190 fire personnel to be on duty uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, as you can see from uh, the chart above, our staffing again at the 190 a day uh, has five battalion chiefs, uh, 33 um, fire engines operating, uh, nine fire trucks, three rescue medic units, uh, one ARF unit, our urban search and rescue unit, and MED-30. Uh, as indicated, the breakdown of our sworn staffing level is uh, one fire chief, one assistant chief, uh, four deputy chiefs, 21 battalion chiefs, 175 captains, four arson investigators, uh, fire prevention inspector, 13, fire engineers 234, firefighter 267. And again, uh, that staffing is broken up uh, into all the fire stations throughout the, the city on three shifts. Looking at our sworn vacancy rates uh, over the last five years from fiscal year 2018 to 2019, uh, these uh, rates uh, have ranged from 2.7 to 9.4. Uh, and we've been able to accomplish this without using a higher head over strategies. Uh, 
Additionally, the 570 uh, personnel, or roughly 190 per day, uh, are filling the, the field positions as I indicated. 30 of the sworn positions are assigned to administrative uh, tasks, such as our training division, uh, fire prevention, uh, other staff positions, and then six sworn senior management positions. And again, that's the uh, fire chief, assistant chief, and the four deputy chiefs. Next slide represents sworn separations and hiring. Uh, again, over a five-year period from 2018 to 2019, our sworn separations have averaged uh, 37 positions uh, annually over that five-year period, and then our sworn hiring has averaged 34 positions uh, each year over that five-year period. Uh, we target to do our entry-level uh, requirements with 25 to 30 fire fire firefighter recruits per academy, and typically those academies last anywhere from 18 to 20 months. Uh, depending on the experience levels of the candidates. Occasionally, uh, there's also uh, a lateral recruitment process where we bring in more personnel in the course of a year, and those academies uh, typically run anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks, again, depending on the background experience, qualifications, and certifications that those candidates bring. The next slide represents absences, vacancies, and backfill trends. Uh, and we're looking specifically at fire captain, fire engineer, firefighter, and then the combined totals. Uh, with that, you'll find in fiscal years 18, 19, we had lower levels uh, through the pandemic years, uh, 2020, 2021, 21, 22, an increase uh, in uh, absence hours and vacancy hours. And you notice as we move into 22, 23, we're starting to have those levels come down based on the hiring uh, and strategies that have been employed, such as uh, our support paramedic program, which has helped to bring those numbers of, of vacancies and opportunities um, to fill vacancies down. Resource deployment. So in the county, there are several other fire departments, uh, San Jose being a metropolitan fire department, uh, much larger than many other agencies, but part of the overall response system in the op area. Santa Clara County Fire Agency staffing to population ratios. Um, if we look at all of the cities combined with the exception of San Jose, uh, we'll find a population of 672,475. Uh, and roughly, uh, they're served by 748 total sworn personnel. And so there's a ratio of about 1.11 uh, fire personnel per thousand uh, to population. Uh, agency staffed by Cal Fire excluded, uh, cities of Morgan Hill, uh, the South County, South Santa Clara County Fire Protection District, and the Cal Fire Unit. And so looking at this graph, you'll see San, uh, San Jose with a population of 959,256 uh, with budgeted 720 positions. Our ratio is 0.75 per thousand. Uh, that also follows in line uh, with uh, some agencies in Southern California, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, and again, um, if you look at uh, Santa Clara County, population of 258,315 serve, that they serve with a, a ratio of point, uh, about 0.96 per thousand in the ratios. And so uh, what you find is that we are still uh, working to increase staffing levels and certainly with the advent of Measure T and some of the things moving forward, future fire stations, uh, it helps to get us closer to a point of increasing uh, our ratios. The next slide uh, is the Santa Clara Fire Agency's uh, company staffing. And so as I indicated, uh, as a metropolitan fire department with the complexity uh, of the fire problem that we have potentially in San Jose with the older construction, uh, high-rise buildings, and just the complexity of um, the incidents that we respond to, San Jose has a staffing level of four per company uh, on our engine companies, four on a truck company, and our daily staffing, again, is at 191. Uh, at the end of the 22-23 fiscal year. And you'll find the other agencies in the county uh, have a mixture of staffing um, from three uh, to four on some trucks. In some cases, Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety actually has two uh, on engine companies, two on four, and two on the truck companies. And what you'll find is that staffing was established uh, years ago in larger communities, uh, supported by things like the Dallas studies in the 70s, which showed the efficiency uh, of a four-person crew versus three-person operations and actually extinguishing fires and achieving um, the individual and company performance standards in extinguishing fires and deploying uh, hose lines. 
So U.S. cities, when you look at the comparison of San Jose uh, in comparison to uh, many, uh, with cities that have populations greater, in eight, greater than 800,000, uh, you will find uh, that San Jose, uh, again, ratio is 0.75 uh, per thousand, and then you'll find that equal to uh, the city of San Jose, excuse me, the city of San Diego uh, at 0.75 as well. If you look at all of the other uh, major cities in America, you'll find sta staffing ratios uh, that, that range from uh, 1.8 uh, all the way up to 1.72, 1.73 in places like New York, uh, Philadelphia at 1.96. And so uh, in comparison, we again, we again are striving to um, increase those levels based on uh, population and the need uh, that we continually uh, assess to determine uh, the right resource. Uh, in the right place. The next slide represents the arson uh, unit staffing. Uh, four authorized arson investigator positions are currently in place. The fourth arson investigator was added in fiscal year 22-23, uh, and that provides for coverage of the uh, three additional uh, arson investigators as a result of them uh, taking vacation or uh, other time off uh, to ensure that we are able to provide uh, some level of coverage. Uh, that arson position is not part of the 190 a day uh, minimum staffing level. Uh, arson investigators, again, are assigned to 24-hour shift schedules and are supervised by a captain on a 40-hour administrative schedule. And so uh, thanks to the council for authorizing uh, that position, uh, which we have uh, promoted recently. The next section will be the sworn recruitment status. So at this point, uh, over the last year, uh, the fire department has filled 80 sworn vacancies. Each classification has unique job requirements and minimum qualifications. Uh, and each of these uh, with the different qualifications requires a separate testing process and recruitment process. And so when we get to uh, our captain's process, our engineer's process, battalion chief's examinations, each have a different process so that people can go through uh, uh, demonstrating the skills, knowledge, and abilities necessary to be promoted to that particular position through passing the process or the exam. Uh, external recruitments are conducted for our entry-level firefighter uh, rank, and that's uh, whether it be um, a, a traditional recruitment process or through our uh, lateral process. All those individuals come with additional experience. Uh, internal recruitments are conducted for promotion, as we said, to non-management sworn ranks uh, as well. Our efforts to address recruitment marketing and outreach uh, uh, include uh, things such as the San Jose Fire Department Women's Boot Camp, which was established in 2019. Uh, recently, uh, the last one was held on June 10th, and uh, we had participation by 42 uh, participants in that process and again gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, provide a recruitment opportunity for women. Uh, this is a program that are taught by uh, women in the organization and again the participation level over the last several years uh, has been uh, well attended. Additionally, uh, we have an opportunity to work with youth 16 to 18 through the San Jose Fire Explorers Post 888. Uh, and these are uh, individuals typically uh, in high school uh, that work towards developing um, both uh, life skills as well as learning uh, firefighting skills uh, and having an opportunity uh, to exercise those skills working with uh, San Jose firefighters with many of uh, the staff in San Jose uh, uh, leading the program, working, them, working with them to develop their skills. Uh, we've had the benefit of some of those individuals that have finished the program and uh, been able to help sponsor uh, one or two over the last couple of years in getting their EMT certification, which is just one of the minimum qualifications necessary at some point uh, to be employed as a firefighter. Uh, we're also designated as an accredited local academy, working closely with the Office of the State Fire Marshal. Uh, there we are able to offer coursework uh, in fire officer uh, development, things like Fire Officer One, uh, chief officer certifications, uh, other coursework uh, that help to prepare uh, uh, the individuals that work within our organization for positions of higher responsibility uh, or uh, specialty skills such as our urban search and rescue team uh, or our um, um, hazardous materials team. 
Uh, we work closely with the South Bay Regional Public Safety Training Consortium. Uh, recently, uh, we did have two participants in a joint uh, academy, uh, along with the City of Palo Alto and other students in that program. Uh, and again, a great opportunity for individuals to be able to uh, go through a Firefighter One Academy, uh, as well as uh, other coursework that is offered there for those that may be seeking promotion. Uh, in terms of advertising, marketing, and social media resources, we will utilize uh, things such as Twitter, Facebook, uh, and other uh, social media to get the word out to the community. We've developed a recruitment videos as well that you'll find on the fire department website. And then last year, or during the fiscal year, we participated in 22 career fairs uh, in different areas uh, throughout the community. And those efforts are all uh, to provide outreach opportunity and to educate individuals that may be seeking careers uh, in the fire service. Next, we'll transition to bilingual services status. You'll find on the next chart uh, the fire sworn personnel demographics. And, and what this reflects uh, are individuals uh, in our organization, a very diverse organization, and their ethnicities. Uh, and then the number, and this represents 652 individuals, which was our uh, filled positions at the end of fiscal year 22-23. Uh, 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 and so with that diversity, we continue to try to build on that uh, so that when we are providing services to the residents through our bilingual program, when we respond to emergencies, having the ability to, to speak to individuals uh, in their uh, respective language, uh, it provides us with a level of synergy, again, and the opportunity to provide the highest level of services to the community here in San Jose. Currently, the department recognizes 20 uh, languages for bilingual certification. 86% uh, of that use is in Spanish and Vietnamese. So taking a look at the chart above, you'll find that 58% uh, of, uh, of the responses we use uh, um, uh, Spanish uh, in that particular response, and 28% of the time you'll find that we are using uh, Vietnamese. And again, this is reflective of information that is uh, put in our records management system based on the response. So when the uh, captain responds, comes back from the incident, completes a report, uh, they f complete a, a report, what we call an infer a National Fire Incident Reporting System that allows the opportunity to capture uh, which language skill was used. Quite frequently we find uh, when we're on the scene there are also bystanders that have the ability or that do the translation for us, perhaps someone's child or grandchild uh, or other family member that helps us to provide that information. Additionally, uh, if that is not the case, we have the ability to uh, contact translation services on the scene. Uh, and with that particular uh, service, we're able to communicate with the patient and provide service, and typically uh, that's in the realm of emergency medical services. This next chart represents our current certified bilingual employees. Uh, the department bilingual policy requires assignment of certified bilingual employees at each fire station during each shift. Department will continue to explore language needs and capabilities. And so uh, the goal really of our bilingual program is to ensure that we're able to provide services uh, to the community all over the city uh, with a goal of having one bilingual staff member at each fire station. And that concludes the report. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Williams. We're going to go to the public to see if there are any comments before we come back to the committee. And we, we have a few folks wanting to ask questions. We have no public comments. Back to the committee. Thank you. OK, I think uh, first on the list was uh, Council Member Torres, please. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. And of course, uh, thank you so much for our to our firefighters for always responding to the needs of our community. So we, we truly appreciate your service. Uh, I do have a couple questions, just uh, some quick ones. What are the exact boundaries of the, the, the special district that you, go, that you help uh, monitor? Yes, Council Member Torres. That is the area that we protect under the Zone 1 Protection Agreement with Santa Clara County. Uh, that service uh, allows us, again, to uh, respond to those areas where we most likely have uh, faster response times. 
because of the proximity of our fire station to those residents. Oh, okay. So, oh, so so the the Santa Clara Central Fire Protection District is is within the city of San Jose. There are areas that they formally serve. That agreement has been in place for many, many years, I believe decades at this point. And so, uh, again, uh, it is area that is under their um, uh, jurisdiction in terms of uh, political boundaries, if you mm -hmm. will. But again, uh, City of San Jose provides that service uh, under the contract. Okay, great. And uh, do we, because it's, it's a special district, and do we somehow get reimbursed when we go out and service these areas? So there is a contract established, and I would have to uh, do a bit more research and follow up with you, which I'm happy to do uh, on the amount uh, of that contract, but there is an annual uh, amount, as I understand. Is that correct, Chief? Yes, it is. Uh, a, a essentially, we are contracting to the county uh, with a, um, a fiscal component to that. And you, you would recognize it geographically by the areas served by the sheriff's office um, in, oh. in your district, for example. So they're essentially unincorporated areas that the county would otherwise serve. Oh, OK, nice. OK, that's, uh, that's good to know. Thank you, Chief. Um, we continue to talk about creating a pipeline in other departments here in the city of San Jose. Are we thinking ab about creating a pipeline for firefighters with some of our community colleges or our technical schools? Because I, I wholeheartedly think that it's, it's, it's really important uh, that you know folks just slide into, into a work instead of, uh, or a, a career instead of seeking a career, I should, I should say, right? Uh, so it, do we have a, so for example, Mission College, right? They have a firefighter program, right? I that is my understanding. Yeah. Um, what do we do to make sure that those, those folks are coming into our department? So as I indicated, uh, some of the programs that we work with currently, uh, obviously, are the Explorers Post 888 and then the South Bay uh, organization, uh, which is a junior college as well. And so uh, that's where we're starting, and we're continuing to look at opportunities uh, that may be available to us uh, moving forward. But again, I think that uh, your thought there is, is an excellent thought uh, and process. And again, I think it's something that we need to uh, continue to uh, work on in terms of developing some of those relationships with some of the uh, entities uh, here uh, you know, in the city specifically, but something that I think we're still striving for uh, and have to look to uh, for future opportunities. Right, and, and, and the, the reason why I say that is because I know when I was a kid, and that was 40 something years ago, when I was a kid, all my classmates wanted to be a police officer or a firefighter. And I haven't been a kid in a very long time, um, but I can assure you, if we were to ask kids today what they wanted to be, I for sure know that it's not gonna be police officer or firefighter anymore, unfortunately, right? And so we wanna to continue to just make sure that, you know, kids do wanna, you know, they wake up every morning wanting to be a firefighter or wanting to be a police officer or a first responder, right? Uh, and so I think that's why it's important for us to make sure that we're, we're creating a, some, some type of a pipeline, right, to get folks in, because uh, I mean, you see, you see the, the beautiful diversity in, in, within our department, right? I, I really like the, the numbers of how many uh, female identified firefighters we have, right? Um, and with that, there is, there is still a little bit of concern, right? I think uh, we saw that the second uh, most folks who are calling in are our Vietnamese community. And, and I know that I'm, you know, I'm sitting right next to a former Vietnamese firefighter, um, but we need to continue to make sure that we're, we're actively recruiting uh, Vietnamese or Filipino or Mandarin speaking firefighters. So, so, you know, thank you. I know that you are trying your best, right? Um, and before I do uh, yield back my time, the social media recruitment for, for jobs, is that just Facebook and Instagram? Uh, we use uh, Twitter as well, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, as you indicated, and then certainly uh, the information that is on the website that the public has access to. Okay, I would, I would, uh, I would definitely recommend 
uh, LinkedIn, because I know at that a, a couple of the recruits, I've been, I didn't go to this last one because we had a community coffee, but at the, I know at the last recruitment, there was actually a few, I think, former high-tech people or former teachers who decided to become firefighters, right? They, they began a new career at 30-something years old or even like 35 years old. Um, and so I think it's important that we, that we utilize LinkedIn, um, that we utilize Snapchat for the younger folks, and that got off old, you know, TikTok. I think a lot of uh, our younger generation is, a, is on TikTok, and uh, I think our city needs to do a better job of, of making these positions cool on TikTok. So, um, and with that, I, I accept item, oh, did you want to respond to that? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, ju I just wanted to thank you for your comments, and uh, certainly, uh, uh, we have heard that under advisement and have taken notes, and so uh, we'll see what we can do to work uh, towards achieving some of those things. Great, thank you. And with that, I, I uh, accept uh, item D1 to go before the council. So, you make a motion, right? Yeah, accepting the report. I'll second. Okay, so there's a motion to accept the report in a second, and then we have Council Member Duan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chief, for the, the report. Uh, I know that our departments have been running short for many, many years um, at less than one firefighter per thousand. And this trend been going for years. What are our plan on moving that number up to compared to other metropolitan area? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, so as you are aware, um, the, well, let me, let me back up because you, you uh, I shouldn't assume that you're aware. The, uh, in, in 2016, the department um, completed a, a third party study uh, that was a standards of cover document. Um, it, we may recall it as the city gate study, uh, yes. but it was a, a department organizational review. Um, simultaneously, uh, we uh, asked council to approve the fire department's strategic business plan. Uh, together, uh, those documents have guided actions uh, relative to uh, how we communicate to council largely. So uh, we did a lot of work to uh, begin to improve our ability to capture data and to understand how we're serving the community uh, out of uh, many of those communications came uh, the uh, 2018 bond measure, Measure T, where we uh, were able to build some infrastructure in order to be able to uh, take on uh, higher staffing levels. Uh, the new stations uh, at first included stations 37 uh, on Lincoln Avenue, station um, 32 uh, on Felipe near McLaughlin and Story, and station 36 near McLaughlin and Capitol. Um, and uh, on top of that, we had the opportunity to expand the, the scope of the new Fire Station 20 at the International Airport uh, to include a landside bay, which also added response capacity. And so um, I, I think the uh, model is sound, which is we identify uh, areas or, or gaps in service that need to be strengthened. Uh, and as we can articulate that to council, uh, and begin to build the infrastructure necessary to be able to have that kind of staffing capacity, uh, I think we can get to a place where uh, we can bring that number up. I, I don't think, frankly, uh, I don't know that 1.0 per 1,000 is the number. I, I actually think it's higher if we're looking at performing at four minute response times. And so I don't really um, target that number. If you gave me that much staff today, I wouldn't have any place to put them. I wouldn't have the fire engines nor the fire stations. Um, but certainly I know that we have gaps in service and we need to strengthen our staffing in the long term as we can build for it. And yes, thank you, Chief. I, I, I do understand that. I know that we shut down station 33. We, we have reduced dual company into a single engine company. Um, the staffing is, is um, always been low, and, and I know that our city and our citizen um, look into for ways to get more funding so that you can build more station and staff appropriately to, to meet the, the growth or at least the, the amount of citizen that we have here for services. Just for the understanding of the public out there, 
would you explain um, why do we have four-man engine, uh, the benefit, and also to comply with Cal OSHA um, and um, the two-in, two-out uh, policy? So just a, a note in response to that question, um, the, the CityGate study uh, in 2016, part of the scope was to answer that question uh, as to what the company staffing levels should be. Uh, the resulting uh, response was that 4.0 was the minimum level staffing for both engines and trucks, primarily because our stations are so far apart that we cannot operate uh, assuming that we're going to have the second or third in company supporting us uh, in, in sufficient time. Uh, to answer your question about operations, um, uh, there is a legal requirement that, um, I'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible, if we arrive on scene uh, of a structure fire and there is a confirmed person trapped, we, no matter the staffing level, can take immediate action and effect rescue or do everything we can to save lives. However, the law states that it is that if you do not have a confirmed rescue, uh, you shall, for the first two personnel that you ask to enter the environment or the, the the, the term is immediately dangerous to life or health environment that you shall have two firefighters standing by exterior of the building to effect rescue in case they get in trouble. And so the, the four person staffing model um, is um, the, the minimum standard if you're gonna be operating alone for some period of time. Uh, I think the 2016 recommendation still stands um, even though we've built another station. We still have a couple more to go in that process, um, but uh, it'll be some time, I think, before we have the uh, response time performance that would allow us to operate independently like that. All right. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> On the recruitment, I know that our female firefighter is, is I, I believe, is like less than 1%. One, one point, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Less than 2%. Am I correct? Uh, we currently have 24 uh, women in the organization. Uh, I believe that number is uh, slightly over 1%. Okay. And then also in the, um, the Vietnamese population here is about 130,000 people, which is around 13% of the, the city population. And how many percent do we have uh, of Vietnamese firefighters? Uh, that's information that I'll have to get back to you with uh, on the particular number. Uh, I believe it's less than 2% as well. Am I correct? Um, but obviously, do we have any incentive um, when we hire on a new firefighter or paramedic, um, just like our PD department, they have incentive to, to help you know, make that decision to come to our uh, city as a firefighter? We, we currently uh, offer an incentive for uh, lateral firefighter hires, um, but that's the extent of that program. Okay, and how has the depart department reduced the timeline to hire a firefighter? Because I know sometimes it takes us up to a year, um, sometime more, sometime less. So the process is long and arduous. Um, how do we reduce that timeline so that way we can get the needed firefighter onto the department? Generally speaking, the, the rigorous background process that we have candidates go through is, uh, at minimum, my experience has been a three to four month period. Um, never a year. I, I think when, when we talk about a year, it, it may be to build a, an eligibility list. Um, often those are spread over uh, two years apart. Um, but the onboarding process, once we've identified who we're going to hire, um, usually was, is within four months. There, there really is not, at least if, if we're going to stick to um, the, the point in time where we make uh, conditional offers and job offers, 
um, not a lot of wiggle room to shorten the time period. Um, and we do compare um, quite on par with most of the, the fire agencies that I'm aware of. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I do understand. I, I know that from the time the person who are interested take the test, going through the psych, you know, after the job offer, off, before the job offer, they have to go through the physical agility, the psychological, and the background check. Um, it could take quite a bit of time. But um, thank you for, for speeding up the program. Uh, does the department ever th thought about having a paramedic program inter internally? Uh, we have, uh, in the past, trained paramedics, uh, internal uh, firefighters to that level. Um, I, I think it is something we will want to possibly evaluate for the future. Um, there are some rule sets, if you will, or, or um, some processes in the organization that make that somewhat of an inefficient process. Uh, our last experience, for example, was we had uh, the firefighters who went through and were trained to paramedic level uh, also became eligible for promotion uh, very soon after, and so the, the investment um, wasn't fully realized, I think, in terms of, of how quickly they, they stopped being frontline paramedics. And so uh, I do think it, it, it is a um, valuable consideration. I don't know that I would recommend post hire training, but there might be um, to the previous question in terms of of pipelining folks opportunities, especially as we see uh, the potential for the change in how we deliver emergency medical services to maybe begin to onboard non-sworn personnel who could track into the firefighter positions over time and uh, we could maybe achieve the training at a, at a more achievable cost. Well, th thank you for the answer, Chief, and congratulations on um, the groundbreaking of Station 8 today. And um, again, thank you for all the firefighters out there and the chief for leading the department, uh, doing a great job out there. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Council Member Batra. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for that report. And I think you analyzed your working population or the sworn officers and all in many different ways and it really helps us give a good profile of your um, firefighters. I have a couple of curiosity questions, may not be hiring related. In, in our city, there are pockets which are county, uh, they're considered part of the county, like Almaden Expressway and some of the hills in Almaden. They are, even the homes, are not in the city, they are part of the county. Now, do, how do those people invoke the fire service? Uh, does it come to the city of San Jose and if it happened to be located in the county, then the call gets transferred to the county? Or? Generally speaking, the uh, cell phones are precise enough um, today that the origination of the caller is matched to the right public safety answering point. Uh, there are areas that are a, a little less reliable, like freeway corridors, because people are passing through very quickly and they often get transferred directly to the, the California Highway Patrol call center. Um, but generally speaking, the, the uh, caller's uh, location will drive which uh, PSAP they go to. Um, you have some peculiar areas in, in your district where actually, uh, for example, uh, the hillside that, that, that transverses your, your district has San Jose areas, county areas, and state responsibility areas. And so um, right. all of those uh, generally will come to San Jose because we are the closest area, and certainly the zone one areas that are county pockets uh, are ours. Um, often you, you will see a dual response with CAL FIRE, just uh, depending on, on how the call is processed, but generally there's no delay um, based upon those distinctions. So, so this, the people don't have to know whether they're part of county, bar, whether they're part of San Jose. The, the, the location automatically gets them to the right place and get the service? Uh, 
Right, so two things will happen. One is um, it's likely that they will get the right public safety answering point. Uh, if they don't, uh, when it comes to county, we have a, a computer-aided dispatch to computer-aided dispatch link where we uh, transfer information very quickly as well. So generally speaking, we don't see a, a lot of delays in that area for 911 callers. Okay, all right. Thank you for clarifying that. It looked a little, um, got a question about your, I look at the 2022-2023, you end up with the largest gap in terms of the approved authorized positions and the actually staffed positions. And mostly it seems to be is because of the number of retirements you had in the two years, the 2021 and 2022, um, 36 and 38. Um, in terms of your 2023, even uh, 2023, 2024, even though we are not talking about that report, how are you trending? Are you having similar kind of retirements levels which are in 2021? 2022 and 2022 and 23? Thank you, I think that's a great question. There's a, a few drivers uh, happening. One is, you're right, we are in a period of high attrition. Um, I, I kind of think about a, a, a big picture wave um, that I've noticed in my career, which is there seemed to be a lot of hiring that occurred in the 70s. We saw a lot of attrition and hiring in the 90s and we're right back to that place where we're seeing a lot of attrition and, and need to do a lot of hiring now. Uh, the reason the gap has been slow to close, frankly, is because we slowed hiring because we could not find paramedics in the applicant pool. Uh, this is true not just for San Jose, but it's true across the state and really, frankly, across the nation. Uh, we are just now seeing some recovery in those numbers for new paramedics coming online. Um, as far as your final point there, uh, I do think there's a little caveat to what I think is a slowdown of attrition, and that is that 20 years ago, we hired two lateral firefighter classes. So these were individuals who had service time when they got to us, and they're, they're spiking the, the attrition um, as well because they're, they're starting to, to close out their careers. So a few drivers that are, that are driving up the vacancy rate and, and obviously the paramedic issue has slowed our ability to hire. Uh, I am hoping uh, to do significant catch up at the turn of the year as we prepare for our next two academies. Thank you. So the last question or comment would be is that you had 141 people retire in the last five years. You may bring in 141 additional ones the people who are retiring are retiring with a lot of experience. So even though it's a one-to-one, -one, we are counting you lost 141 and you hired 141, do you have enough expertise left by those people and not creating a gap in terms of, you know, where they can pick up the thing where the others left? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I, I, I think um, we do end up with uh, a, a knowledge and experience drain when we lose our senior folks. Um, I, I do take significant comfort in, in that. I think our training today is better than it's ever been. Um, we are, as was mentioned, an accredited local academy. We're providing the most advanced state fire training uh, that, that exists. Um, and we do have a core of officers in, in our city that, that do have 10 plus years of experience um, and, and do a, a great job in, in terms of mentoring and coaching and, and more importantly, providing uh, command and, and supervision uh, on the fire ground. Um, but that's been a challenge, I think, for the organization for a long time, which is you do lose a lot of, uh, a, a lot of smarts when, when folks who have been here quite some time walk away. Thank you, Chief, for keeping our people and property safe in San Jose. Thank you. Okay, uh, I know we have Vice Mayor Kamei virtually, so she's on Zoom and I know she's alone, and I'm curious if she has any questions. <laughs> 
She has her hand raised. Oh, okay, wonderful. Go, go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, a lot of my uh, questions have been answered, uh, but I, I first of all want to say thank you so much uh, to all the firefighters who um, uh, protect us and, and, and do really, really difficult work. Um, I wanted to ask whether or not there was any nationwide initiative similar to what the police department has with 30 by 30, where um, uh, it's an initiative that looks at how we can learn uh, from other uh, entities, you know, similar entities uh, to be able to recruit women. I think that uh, what my colleague um, uh, Omar Torres said uh, in terms of the pipeline, uh, I think that we have to do something earlier and um, give uh, those who may not ever think that they would be uh, going into a career as a firefighter, the opportunity to let them know that, yes, in fact, uh, it is a great career. Uh, it is uh, uh, demanding, but certainly very uh, uh, valuable. And, uh, and so I, I was just curious in terms, is there anything similar in the firefighter world that, you know, nationwide, there might be an initiative on the recruitment side, on the learning side, on the sharing of, uh, you know, what works to recruit more women. Uh, I think 24 women uh, is great, but it's such a small number compared to how many uh, firefighters there are. So I just, I was just curious. Thank you, Council Member. Great question. Um, I, I will say that yes, we are uh, leveraging partners uh, to that end. Uh, however, right now we are not nationwide. Um, the fire service uh, is, is very state specific in terms of uh, training uh, requirements. Uh, and so we, this last cycle uh, of recruitment, uh, joined uh, a program uh, that is delivered by the California Firefighter Joint Apprenticeship Committee. Uh, they do uh, have focused efforts on uh, diversity recruitment, uh, including programs to uh, really try to elevate awareness for, for women in the fire service. This is our first time through this recruitment. Uh, it does give us access to the entire state recruitment list that they maintain. Uh, which is different from our previous process, which was just San Jose's recruitment alone. And so we are excited about how this can evolve in the future. Um, there is a, under that program, an actual women's commission that is focused on, on hiring women as well, and we hope to leverage that relationship going forward. I, I would like to be as helpful as possible. Uh, even, you know, hosting, I'm, I'm happy to host uh, uh, you know, maybe having a, a forum of some sort of these women who are on the commission, uh, because I think that your annual uh, women's boot camp is great, but I think that there has to be sort of something that that people can can uh, uh, look to to say, oh, you know, I may be interested in this, and and we could encourage it and have it as a continuous thing and not just annual, because I do know that um, many don't see themselves in those positions simply because there are very few who are in those positions. And so anything that I can do or, you know, in terms of being able to support uh, you and, and the department on, on, on recruitment is something that I think that uh, uh, would be very helpful. So I put that out there uh, for you uh, to think about and, and certainly uh, it's something that if we if we were able to you know add a percent, uh, you know uh, over time another percent and another percent I think that it would really help and it would be part of the pipeline as uh, Councilmember Torres mentioned. Uh, so it does take time, but I do think that uh, we have to put a little bit more effort in there if possible. And certainly, um, I would uh, I would like to help with that. Thank you, Council Member. I am happy to uh, let you know that one of the eight commissioners uh, is uh, a San Jose firefighter, and uh, I think we will work to connect uh, all of us uh, to further that discussion. Is that it, Vice Thank Mayor? you so much. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much.
Okay, thank you. And I think there was a motion and a second, so we'll go ahead and take the vote. Quattro? Yes. Torres? Yes. Kame? Yes, and I'm alone. <laughs> Duan? Yes. And Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we'll, we'll go move on to item uh, two, uh, which is the innovation technology. And thank you so much, uh, Assistant Chief and Fire Chief. Uh, we'll move on to innovation technology projects, biannual status report. I know we have a group of folks, uh, Shirley, Jesse, and Khalid, going to come up and give a presentation. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Jimenez, committee members and members of the public. My name is Khaled Taufik. I'm the Chief Information Officer. And presenting with me is Jesse Juarez, our new Portfolio Products and Project Division Manager, and Shirley Young, our IT Project Manager. We're here to present the Innovation and technical Technology Projects Biannual Status Report. And to get us started, I will turn it over to Jesse. Thank you, Khaled. Good afternoon, Chairperson, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Jesse Waros. I'm the Division Manager in the Information Technology Department responsible for the City's Portfolio Products and Project Office. I'm starting with this slide, which depicts City priorities because it serves as a reference point in determining alignment with City goals when assigning project management team resources. Later in the presentation, you'll be provided a visual showing how the City's projects line up with these priorities. Establishing the Portfolio Products and Project Management Office proved to be effective in advancing the city's ability to implement innovative, large-scale projects successfully. This slide shows how the project management team is generally organized. This structure better ensures business alignment with current city initiatives. The program continues to mature and advance and includes further developing the team and incorporates industry standard project management methodologies and tools. The long-term strategy includes sharing and training project management methodologies across the entire organization. This approach better ensures enterprise-wide consistency in project management, which helps to increase the success rate of projects not only managed by the project management team, but for those projects not managed by the project management team. Generally speaking, projects assigned to and managed by the project management team must meet two of the four criteria depicted on this slide. Those include the cost exceeds $500,000, a project involves more than one department, a project has a multi-year implementation schedule, or is deemed high profile or sensitive. Using this criteria as a baseline for the project intake better ensures maximum value to the city regarding resource allocation and a better opportunity for project success on the city's largest project investments. I'll now turn the presentation over to Shirley Young, who will briefly go over all the vision manage city projects, including current status and respective alignment to city priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Good afternoon, Chairperson, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Shirley Young, and I am a project manager in the Information Technology Department. This slide depicts four major projects completed since we reported to this committee last March, specifically a new applicant tracking system, community Wi-Fi deployments for eight attendance areas in the East Side Union High School District, a housing loan management system, and the rent registry portal. Beyond these successful implementations, there are numerous projects currently being managed by the team. This slide is an overview of all projects currently being managed by the division. These projects contribute to each of the city council focus areas or a critical internal initiative. They are color-coded by project status with a legend on the right of the slide. Gray is project initiation. Red indicates action is needed in order to put the project back on track. Yellow indicates there are some delays and the team is actively mitigating the issues. Green indicates the project is on track with respect to budget, scope, and timeline. And blue indicates the project has been completed. The next slide will have more information on the red and yellow status projects. 
This slide provides information on all projects that are yellow and red, including status updates. I'd like to address the project we currently have in red status. For the business tax system, the first RFP was not successful because the scope was written too narrowly, and as a result, the city did not receive enough proposals. Updates have been made to the scope, and the second RFP is set to be released by the end of this month. It will be on track by the next time we meet. The projects that are currently in yellow status are experiencing some delays. However, we are mitigating them, and we fully expect them to be on track in green the next time we meet. This slide is a screenshot of the division's public dashboard from the city's website. It provides an overview of the division's 21 projects currently being managed with a total estimated budget of $32 million. We've updated the dashboard since the last time we presented to you. For example, the graphics and data have been simplified, making the information easier to follow and understand. The dashboard is dynamic and interactive. You can click on different variables, and it's also fully accessible to the public on our city website. I will now hand the presentation over to Jesse to, to discuss project standards. Thank you, Shirley. The project team was formed in 2020 and included adopting general methodologies and practices depicted on the slide under previous practices. The program has since achieved the level of maturity, staffing, and organizational structure necessary to allow it to shift to the next level. The new standards column on this slide depicts the general direction of the project office and the changes that are currently being implemented. These changes ensure alignment with three goals. First, standardized project management training across the entire team. Second, standardized program and project management methodologies. And third, enhanced project intake criteria. These changes better ensure the project management team is properly prepared to deliver projects in a standardized, repeatable, and predictable manner. It also ensures appropriate level resources are assigned to high investment and or critical projects. Further, it allows for easier adjustment, backup, and global familiarity across the team and builds in redundancy and flexibility within the program. Thank you for your time and I welcome questions and feedback. Do we have any uh, public comment? We have no public comment. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, thank you to Council Member Torres. He's going to yield his time so that way if Vice Mayor Kame have any question at this point. No, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Okay, we're back to Council Member Torres. No, just uh, move to approve item D2. Did we have a second? Yep. Oh, I, I will okay. second. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other question from our council? Go ahead, okay. Council Member. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think in terms of, I was hoping that in this report, you will highlight something of, uh, all your projects are of great significance, but I was hoping that you would highlight one or two of the projects which are in the completed category, uh, which have a great significance so that not only you know that, but we know it and the public knows. So if you wouldn't mind picking up one or two to highlight that. Thank you, Council Member Batra. Um, there are a few projects that have been completed. The main one is impacted or will result in a better interface with the public for the council meetings. Uh, we just implemented the Prime Gov solution, which currently being <coughs> excuse me, uh, executed in parallel or, or managed in parallel to the uh, Grantus. And they, they hope we're gonna run it for three to four council meetings and that will really change how we interact with the public and there are few changes, enhancements that improve how we publish uh, the agenda management online and also allow the improved and simplified searches for the public related to the agenda management and the, and the memos. Uh, so this is really has not implemented. Uh, we're just running it just to make sure everything is, is working properly before we cut over completely to the new system. And that should happen in the next uh, three weeks or so. 
think the point which uh, I wanted to also mention about your work, I think the, one of the biggest changes in the last year or two years is that you are handling the projects which are always involving multiple departments, multiple groups, and the way you are managing those and the way you are delivering the results of those, I think is a new process and is a very effective process with the good delivery in terms of completing the projects. So I think in one of the future meetings, I would request that you take one of those projects, which is, I happen to know, <laughs> multidimensional. If you would give a little bit of a description of the challenges of that project and how you tackle them and how you brought the results from the group to the thing, because I think IT is our core we depend on because we will never have ever be able to do the human beings be able to do all the work which needs to be done. So the IT and the automation is what we depend on. And, but it stays in the background. So I'd like to get a little bit more visibility into it so that everybody in the community knows what you're doing and how you're making the city work better. Okay. I certainly appreciate your kind remarks and uh, definitely we, the project that you're referring to is the uh, abandoned vehicles and a, we're hoping to go live with the system in January. So by the next implementation, we will be able to share the, the good and the bad and the ugly related to the implementation. And it's really, uh, truly a partnership with the seven departments that uh, collectively were able to change how we do business and how we address the, uh, the challenge related to abandoned vehicles. But I appreciate your, your question and definitely by the next meeting, we should be able to, to share more with the, uh, with the committee. Hey, th thanks for continuing to improve the efficiency and getting the government work even more transparently and better. Thank you, sir. We're going to go down to, now to Council Member Duan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, IT, for a lot of incredible work. Can you highlight what is success with the 311 system and have the percentage of resident using 311 climb or decline? Uh, at the beginning of the year, we had about 60,000 customers or residents with the active accounts in the system. And our goal uh, is to achieve 80,000 by December. We are on track to exceed 80,000 and uh, we're establishing our new goal now to achieve 100,000 by the end of the physical year. So we we're seeing an increase in the usage, an increase in the accounts. We have been very active in, in public uh, meetings and, and community meetings. We're trying to get the word out to get more people to use it. We are making a lot of enhancements in the system that's gonna be deployed uh, around December, January timeframe. And we're hoping the, uh, the enhancements and the simplifications of the screen will be more attractive and, and be more engaging for the public to use. Uh, so we're looking forward to see how we can take it to the next level. But it's been, it's been a, a great opportunity for us to engage with the public and the numbers and even the customer satisfaction numbers are increasing uh, you know, gradually over the month by month. So we encourage with the results and, and we still have a, lo a long way to go. But the goal really to at least to get 100,000 active accounts uh, to be used for the 311. And have the, have your department used social media to, to at least get the words out there to our residents? We, we haven't been using social media as effective as we would like to. We are currently recruiting for uh, uh, a marketing manager to help us to focus and to develop in that program for us. And we, we just opened the position and we are in the recruitment. We're hoping once we get the manager on board that we'll be able to dedicate that person to develop the community engagement programs and the outreach. Uh, we are working with the Cal State uh, University to help us develop a new program for marketing uh, in, in minority programs. Uh, but we, we definitely, uh, this is something that we identified as uh, an area of growth and, and we're hoping once we hire a new manager that will be dedicated to, uh, to expand or to really to explore the, the, the social media uh, interactions with, with the public and, and see how we can get it to the next level. 
Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. I think we have a motion and a second, so we'll go ahead and vote. Batra? Yes. Torres? Yes. Kame? Yes, and I'm alone. Duan? Yes. And Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to our next item, which is item three, San Jose Police Department Cannabis Regulations. We have uh, Wendy uh, and uh, Sergeant uh, Woolsey. Whenever you guys are ready. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, chairperson, committee members, and members of the public. My name is Wendy Salazi, and I'm the division manager in the police department's division of cannabis regulation. And with me today is Sergeant David Woolsey. When we went to City Council on June 13th for zoning and regulatory changes, City Council directed staff to conduct a comprehensive review of the administrative citation schedule of fines for violations related to the cannabis regulatory program. We were directed to return first to the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee prior to going to City Council. We were asked to compare San Jose's schedule of fines to similar California cities and provide recommendations to bring the cannabis fines more in line with, in line with comparable cities. Fines related to San Jose's cannabis regulatory program were originally drafted in 2014 to encourage compliance with the new program and deter violations of the city's municipal code. When the fine structure was developed, the city was one of the first in the state to develop this type of program, and the state had not yet established a regulatory program for adult use in medicinal cannabis. The state began its regulatory program in 2018. Staff reviewed the fine schedules for cannabis-related violations for various California cities, including Oakland, Sacramento, Redwood City, San Francisco, and Mountain View. While there is no uniform approach to violations, many cities do apply an escalation framework for repeat offenses. Cities typically start with a courtesy notice and then escalate to a citation similar to San Jose's violation framework. However, San Jose's fines were significantly higher. One important distinguish between some of the cities reviewed in San Jose related to how the fines were enforced is San Jose uses administrative citations and other cities approach compliance and determinant with civil legal action. San Jose's current fines for cannabis violations is tiered with the lowest offenses starting at $1,200 and escalating to $5,000 with the more significant offenses starting at $10,000 and escalating to $50,000. When we looked at the fines for violations related to off-sale alcoholic beverage establishments and tobacco retail violations in San Jose, we found those are typically tiered starting at $250 and $500 respectively. The purpose of establishing a fine schedule related to regulated activity is to encourage compliance with the city's municipal code. Compliance can improve when administrative fines are reasonable and proportional to the violation being cited and when fines are escalated for repeat violations. As the regulatory environment has changed since the city's first established its cannabis regulation violations in 2014, staff recommends updating and decreasing the schedule of fines. We believe the updates proposed will still continue to encourage compliance and deter violations. Staff proposes a four-tier uh, framework. Within each category, violations will continue to be escalated with the first violation being the lowest, followed by increases for the second and third violations within a 12-month period. Staff also recommends a change to fines for personal cultivation. 
The current fine for personal non-medical cultivation over the limit is a flat fine of $2,500 for the first violation, $5,000 for the second, and $7,500 for the third and each subsequent violation in a 12-month period. Under this fine structure, a person cultivating one or two plants over the limit would be fined the same as someone cultivating 10 or 20 plants over the limit. Staff recommend changing violations to a per plant fine for personal non-medical cultivation of more than six plants per residence allowed under state law. Using a per plant fine would cause an individual's fine to scale with the egregiousness of the violation versus a flat fine for this type of activity. Staff reviewed the five administrative citations issued in fiscal year 20, 2022 to 23, and the fines totaled $45,000. Two were issued to illegal unregistered businesses, and three were issued to our registered businesses. Staff from the police department and code enforcement conduct regular inspections of the regulated businesses and respond to complaints from residents and businesses about non-compliant businesses and staff refer complaints about illegal businesses to the state for enforcement. Staff strive for opportunities to make the regulatory processes less burdensome for the industry, and during the evaluation of violation fine amounts, we assessed the identification badge requirements. We will be recommending to City Council in November updates in Title VI regarding the badge collection process, including time allowances for businesses to return employee badges to the chief of police. Staff held a meeting with the businesses on October 2nd, and here you see some of the feedback uh, we received. Um, the businesses supported softening the fine schedule, and the industry requested some historical information regarding enforcement actions, and staff is working with the requesting parties in the city's Public uh, Records Act request team to provide that information. And um, they also requested to have the city align San Jose's allowed operating hours with what the state regulations allow. As a result of our review, staff recommends accepting the update on staff's proposed, proposed changes to the administration, administrative citation schedule of fines for violations of Chapter 6.88 for the Cannabis Regulatory Program and cross-referencing the report to be heard at the November 14th City Council meeting. And with that, we're available for questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. We're gonna go to public comment first and then we'll come back to the committee. We have four public speaker cards. Can Sean, Dan, Josh, and Charmy make their way down? Please line up along the steps in front of the podium. One speaker will walk down at a time and you will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members, uh, committee members. Thank you so much, Chair Jimenez. Uh, it's my uh, honor to speak in front of you. Good afternoon again. Uh, I'm Sean Kelly Rye, uh, owner, founder of Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance. We represent the, the legal cannabis industry in the city of San Jose. We want to thank each of you for making the time in your offices to, to meet with the industry executives, to talk with them through the evolution of the industry and what has happened over these many years. Uh, from non-compliance and a non-legal business to a legal entity to something that's now functional and giving the city $18 million a year. Unfortunately, we have seen a slip in those numbers and we're gonna continue to see a slip because the industry has evolved and, we have re and so have our competitors, which is the illegal market. And so um, we wanna uh, thank staff for their uh, recommendation in reducing the fines. We agree with that and we would uh, say that you move forward with that. We wanna also thank Chair Jimenez for his memo and would ask that you support that wholeheartedly because I think that the division itself and the industry, uh, since everyone else has changed, needs to evolve also, right? Literally, the industry has changed, the ground below the industry has changed, and I think just as uh, a responsibility to the citizens, to the children, to everyone else that's impacted through illegal drug sales, we need to evolve also. So thank you very much. I'm available if you have any questions. Uh, please feel free to call on me. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Chair Jimenez, distinguished council members on this committee. My name is Dan Gergiatis. I represent Purple Lotus. Uh, we've been doing business 
up 13th Street where it meets with Oakland Road by the 101 uh, 880 interchange there for uh, 10 years. I've been working uh, in the cannabis regulatory program for 10 years. I want to thank staff for all the work they've done. We, we were ahead of the game you know, 10 years ago, and, and we were evolving uh, with our program until 2018 when California law came online. Uh, but, but since then, uh, I, I think we've just been a little stagnant uh, as a whole and not evolving, as Mr. Kelly Rye was saying. Um, and, and I think that we risk um, just accessibility for children at the smoke shops and outside cannabis deliveries. I was able to go to a smoke shop and obtain this inhalable hemp, which isn't legal under California law. I was able to obtain Delta-8 uh, THC edibles, which I don't think is illegal as well under California law from San Jose smoke shops uh, very easily. Also, uh, I asked Purple Lotus staff about this, and I, I was given an anecdote that uh, a nephew of one of our staff members who's 15 years old was able to obtain a cannabis delivery through a smartphone. So I think there are some serious concerns here as, as far as public safety and even the fiscal health because none of these people are paying taxes. They're not verifying the age of the customers and they, they don't, they flout any operating rules including operating hours. Um, so with, with that said, I do, we, we do support softening the fine schedule as staff has recommended. But we also you know, recommend uh, having the legal operators on a level playing field as everybody else in that we should align the operating hours as was brought up uh, by Ms. Alassi uh, from 6 a.m. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Sharmi Shaw. I represent eight of the 16 licensed, registered cannabis businesses in the city of San Jose. Uh, six of them are in District 7, one of them is in District 6, one is in District 3, and two are opening new locations. Of those, two are opening new locations in District 1. I've been part of this industry since 2014 when the ordinance was first passed. I've worked closely with the department, um, with Sergeant Wolseley and Ms. Alazi. Um, since 2014, I appreciate all the hard work that they've done to help foster this industry in San Jose. Without them, it wouldn't be possible. Unfortunately, the industry has suffered significantly in the last couple of years uh, financially. In 2021, my 10 businesses uh, contributed $11 million to, in cannabis business taxes to the city of San Jose. In 2022, that dropped to 10 million, and we're expecting that to drop even further in 2023. And the predominant reason for this is not because cannabis is not being used by people, it is because of the illegal businesses that have proliferated in the city of San Jose, unchecked and without enforcement. Um, as Ms. Salazi mentioned, we did ask for data. We received it late last night that there is no proactive enforcement against illegal operators. And any enforcement that is done is not done against businesses. It's done against property owners, which has been wholly ineffective. And so we would like to see some additional support of these cannabis businesses that contribute so much to the city of San Jose in terms of enforcement action to help benefit not just the businesses, but also the community at large. It, reiterating what Mr. Um, what Mr. Gruer said and what Mr. Kali Rai said, there has been, uh, there are these cannabis there are these vape shops and smoke shops that are not only selling illegal hemp-derived products, they're also selling cannabis products that they're not allowed to sell by state and city law, and there's no enforcement. So kids are getting it, um, it's untested. Thank you, next speaker. Thank you, Council. Um, my name is Josh Santaga. Um, I'm from Hayes Dispensary. We've been operating since the beginning. Um, we are in District 1. Now, dist 1761 is in District 7. We're moving into District 1, 1154 Saratoga Avenue. Uh, in 2021, we paid 1.2 million in taxes. 2025, I mean, 22, we're gonna pay 950. So you could see that we went down 20%. Um, and we believe that, I guess I was a little naive, um, and then our staff starts talking about these pop-up shops happening every weekend where people are going and buying, you know, cannabis that's not tested. Um, and then we find out that it's smoke shops that are 
also affecting our sales. So basically, I feel like we are losing a good portion of revenue, not because we're not, you know, doing good business, but because we are getting undercut and we're not at a, a level playing field. I have ran a business in San Jose since 1998, raised two children here, San Jose Unified, and I've dealt with my own child getting illegal cannabis, not from me, which would be, but from one of these other places we looked at it, wasn't tested, no CA labels. So it's a definite problem and it's a definite health problem for our kids out there. I know that when they come to our shop, that they are safe. They're getting good cannabis, legal, tested through the system, seed to sale. I can't say what's in those other shops. And I think that as a city, we need to get on the same, you know, city of San Jose police department and us, we need to come together and figure out how we could do this. So Thank you, and now on to Zoom. Blair. Oh, hi, uh, I have my hand up at the wrong, <coughs> excuse me, at the wrong time. I'm waiting for the next item, thank you. David. Hi, um, my name is David Wynn. Um, I operate uh, herbs at 543 Parrot Street in District 7. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Um, I'm one of the, um, you know, owners of the uh, cannabis businesses here since 2015. Um, and of course, everything's been changing quite a bit. Um, I would like to express my frustration with the city's lack of enforcement uh, against illegal operators. Uh, and between 2021 and 2022, I had a loss of revenue of over 18%. Um, and I'm probably going to see something closer to 25%. Uh, here in 2023 um, and just like everyone else is saying these losses are not aren't, aren't due to a lack of of consumers um, but really it's the illegal operators illegal delivery companies coming in um, the smoke shops and vape shops that are also um, selling these types of items um, and just like josh firsthand um, i've my, my teenage goddaughter um, showed me a vape that she was able to get um, from um, one of these delivery services. Um, I've also heard multiple um, friends of hers and she showed me videos even of, of 12 year olds and 13 year olds vaping um, uh, some of these Delta 8 and Delta 9 products. Um, so, you know, these shops, they don't check age. They don't, they, they uh, sell products which are, are, aren't legal, um, sell untested product. Um, and of course they don't, um, you know, pay any taxes. Um, so just like the rest of the, 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 the speakers, I would just like to be on a, a level playing field um, and get some, some eyes on, on more of the enforcement, um, especially when our children are involved. And I have two youngsters <laughs> that are, are, are coming into middle school age uh, soon. Um, so, you know, to close, um, I support the uh, change of hours, uh, support the change of fines, uh, and I'd also like to get some, some, some visibility on, on more of enforcement. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Vice Mayor uh, Kamei. Uh, she's on Zoom and alone, and I'm wondering if she has any questions. Uh, I don't have any questions. I think that um, there there is a, a great point on creating that level playing field, and and certainly uh, there is a, a, the danger of uh, unregulated, unknowing of of products that are out there and, and what can be done. I know that it takes, uh, you know, uh, staff resources uh, to be able to uh, work on enforcement, uh, but I think that it's something that, uh, that I think really needs to be looked at. And uh, I do agree with uh, the memo um, that um, uh, Chair Jimenez uh, has, and, and I think that uh, we need to, to figure out how we can uh, uh, work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is uh, Council Member Duan. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for Thank you, staff, for the report. It's, um, it's a common theme that I hear is, is the lack of um, enforcement of illegal, illegal 
uh, smoke shop, bake shop, or, or just a pop-up shop, if you will. And the, the question, what, what are we doing about it? And, and part of my question is this. I know that the shop pay a high operating fees to the, the city. Is there a possible way we can reduce that fees and use that money to hire a person who designate to enforcement? Council, council member, do you want to direct to, to staff, I assume? Yeah, I'm sorry, that, that's to the staff. Right? So, just so I can understand the question, the, the question is can we reduce the level of oversight or fees um, and taxes that the cannabis businesses pay, but then hire additional resources to have oversight of the illegal non-conforming businesses? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, so I would actually ask uh, Rachel Roberts to join us in the box, um, specifically with the memorandum out. So the, you know, the vape and smoke shops have a different oversight model, and I do want to say as the city administration, I do empathize with the businesses that spoke, um, because it is an issue, I think, as a city, we're trying to get our arms wrapped around. Um, Rachel, let me ask you a question, then I'll speak again, but what, what type of um, fees or tax structure do the smoke and vape shops pay for the oversight model that we have within code enforcement, if any, now? Uh, thank you for the question. I'm Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. So um, the, the program that you're referring to is our tobacco retail license program. So we're only doing proactive enforcement and regulating businesses that are subject to that permit. Um, so it may or may not include some of the businesses that they are referring to. Okay, that's helpful. You know, I definitely think, uh, you know, with the um, recommendation in the chair's memorandum, which I'd say at a staff level look fine, um, except for 3C, I would ask for some flexibility on timing. I do think it's appropriate um, to look at how we have oversight and accountability, especially if there's illegal activity happening around those businesses. I do think it is a larger of question as where, where does that reside? Is it um, within the police department or code? Um, also, I know Rachel was just in front of our Neighborhood Services and Education Committee last week, and there's been a, a lot of work that was directed by the full council around flavor, to, flavor tobacco um, and nitrous oxide sales, so code and PD are already partnering on that. Um, but again, as a larger who has responsibility, what's a fee structure, what's appropriate, I think that would be better included in the budget process. So we're happy to bring that back through the budget process with more analysis. Um, but would ask for flexibility on that rather than doing that in the 90 days. But I think your question's a fair one. I just think it would take us time to really analyze that. Here's a question for the industry. I know some of you are losing 20%, maybe more, maybe less, per year. So let's say every year you lose 20%. Then wouldn't it be better to, to, to pay some type of extra taxes to have the enforcement so that way you can gain your profit? I'm not sure. Is the industry willing to do that? Is, is anyone can answer me on that one? Well, I was going to ask you if you wanted to direct it to any particular person that came up. I know Sean's here. Obviously, there's some. Well, so I, and I would just say I think um, I don't think that would follow state law. Um, the cannabis businesses pay fees and taxes. Uh, we regulate them, so there's a nexus. I think if we wanted to look at additional regulations and oversight of smoke, vape, or tobacco companies, we'd be needing to look at a fee or tax structure on them. Um, I don't think we'd be able to um, dedicate the resources of the cannabis businesses, which are very you know, narrowly focused and specific, onto another business's oversight. Uh, maybe that question probably go to um, our attorney. Yeah, 
And, and I would just say, just as it has, having written the memo uh, that, that you had a chance to look at, if you, if you look at item 3C on the memo, it's just explore the possibility of expanding the scope of the Department of Cannabis regulation to include vape. So that's, I don't know the answer and what the correct sort of way to have it structured, if even at all possible. And that's one of the reasons I put that in there is just to go back, do the work and bring it back, because I'd like to better understand what the contours of that framework may look like. Uh, but without that direction, we, we, there's, there's no direction to go explore that. And so to your point that we need to do some work on that, that's. Agree. So um, I move to accept the staff report to include council member Jimenez memo. Oh. Yeah, we need to, to cross-reference cross it to the November 14th meeting. Okay, to uh, include the cross-reference to November 14th. Second. Can the administration ask for grace on recommendation 3C um, that we have flexibility on the timeline of when that comes forward given the other council direction uh, to code enforcement around the work around flavored tobacco? Yeah, I, I'm sort of deferring to, to the maker of the motion. I, I, what I was expressing to him is that I have some questions to better understand exactly what that grace period looks like or what that time frame looks like. Um, I can ask those now or I can wait till later. I mean, so so can, tell you, can you tell us what's the flexibility? I mean, what is normally is 90 days? What are you asking for? Well, I, well, I put in the memo 90 days. I, I don't know exactly what we're... I, what I honestly don't know. Um, I, I saw the memo 15 minutes before the meeting started. I haven't had a chance to talk to the chief, um, our director of planning, building, code enforcement. So I don't know if it's achievable in 90 days, um, but I know the full council directed a lot of work towards the code enforcement around flavored tobacco. And I don't want to make a statement here that yes, we can do it in 90 days um, and fall short of that. So I'm asking for a little bit of flexibility, whether it's 90 days or through the budget process, which may be appropriate if you guys would like to consider additional taxes and fees uh, to be placed on those businesses. Yeah, Lee, I'm trying not to <laughs> take, take Council Member Duan's sort of thunder, but I'll, I'll let him respond however he wants to respond and then. We'll, well, why don't we wait until all the questions is, is asked and then we'll, we'll go back to it. Okay, fair, fair enough. So, so we'll go to Council Member Torres. I think he had some questions. All right, can, can I, is it okay if I call back Sean Kelly, right? To the podium? Cer certainly is, you can call up. Sean. Yes, Council Member. Yeah, I, um, the Chair. What did you, what do you think about the, the time needed for flexibility for item 3D, 3C, I'm sorry, 3C? Well, well we're dealing with multiple things. Um, the illegal activity is problematic. Uh, there's fentanyl that is laced on these cannabis products that are being sold in illegal. Now, normally if you inhale cannabis, you are not gonna have an adverse side effect like death. But if you're gonna take a fentanyl laced cannabis product, you do have a, a, a real reality of death. I, I have had council conver conversations with your council colleagues, Council Member Davis for one of them, who is seeing fentanyl on cannabis in her schools. It is problematic. Waiting is, is entirely your choice, but you do risk bodily injury to children or whoever else is ingesting fentanyl-laced cannabis. I don't think the budgetary process well, really cares. This is not a financial issue. It's a public safety health issue. It has nothing to do with the budget. Uh, I'm sympathetic to staff's needs for wanting more time. Uh, this is a conversation I did have with Wendy of the department. Uh, this is a conversation that the industry has been having constantly over the last year, even longer. And the continuous refrain has been that your funds, your $2 million a year, do not fund enforcement. They only, inf they only fund compliance with the program. And I think that's what, to the heart of what Council, uh, pardon me, Chair Jimenez's memo goes to, is that core ideology, that core focus needs to shift. It, it made sense in 2014, 2015. The industry has evolved. 
unfortunately the legal industry of all so much faster than we do we have regulations they don't they take they move fast and break things and unfortunately they break things and that's people's lives and so i think that that there are things that we can do right away but there are also things that we can we can perhaps look that may need a little bit more time but but this is the most over regulated into the business here in this city along with gaming and other cities don't have this level of compliance they just don't i think chair jimenez his memo is very thoughtful because what he's doing is using those those dollars that council member don was mentioning and increasing the pool of people that under the purview once you bring smoke and vape shops and those operators under the division of cannabis regulation maybe you change the name to division of cannabis hemp smoke shops and vape shops regulation then you can put them into compliance then you can start shutting them down it's not enforcement at that point which is a function of pd it's then compliance and i don't think there's any operator that's going to say hey we're willing to pay our fair share they should also pay their fair share they're already paying to the tobacco retail program and once they're all under the the same umbrella then they can all be regulated equally and that's that fair playing field that level playing field that the industry is talking about i think that's the easiest solution it's 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 pretty straightforward all of these programs all of this enforcement the san jose pd has been been working on illegal drugs since its inception these are not new concepts i don't i don't think they need a whole lot of time to be flushed out um, there, there's a lot of things that that pd is very good at and and we do have a great pd if you per capita we are not oakland we are not san francisco thank goodness so so respectfully i think there's there's some leeway on time but certainly not the budget process that's far too far and this has nothing to do with the money and and let's not forget these illegal drugs are gonna have a human impact and mostly children and so as you move forward i want you to think about that i'm a father i know many of you are many of you are have young children that are nephews and nieces and so forth. Everyone's telling you these stories. It's very easy to get this stuff. And, and this is your illegal drug dealer right here. This is your illegal drug dealer. Every one of these kids has one of these in their pocket. It's not some guy walking down the street, black or brown or some other color, wearing a hoodie. It's this. This is the illegal drug right here. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and before, so before, I don't think I have uh, too much time now. Uh, I just have a, um, a couple questions. Um, I had plenty of them, um, but I'll just uh, ask the ones that I think are important for me. Uh, what is, uh, to our city staff, what is considered a egregious violation? For that one, that would be more related to if they're, they sell to someone who's under 21. Uh, that we would consider an egregious violation um, operating without you know being registered that would be an egregious violation um, okay I think, I think those were the the two big ones in there that Agreed. we i mean we felt strongly about keeping those at the highest level okay. and um the how does uh how does our city's uh regulatory program align with the state's regulatory program In, in what capacity? Like, what do you? Well, is uh, we regulate we regulate cannabis, right? But so does the state, right? Uh, maybe this is a more of a what's in your opinion? Um, do you do you feel that our city's regulatory uh, re regulatory program aligns with the state's regulatory program? I mean, I think our rules are, are similar. Our code is, is, well, I mean, I think we're a little bit more restrictive. The state has general guidelines, and they allow the flexibilities for cities to make decisions that work best for their, for their city. So we can be uh, more restrictive. And in our case, I think in some, of, some areas we are. We could be more restrictive. Yeah, any city, yeah. The state okay. just has general guidelines, and they allow the flexibility for the cities to make their own regulations to be more right. restrictive if you want. And, and, and uh, thank you for that, by the way. I don't, I don't have uh, too much time, but I, I do want to say this. Um, we wouldn't have a healthy surplus if it wasn't for our cannabis industry. We, were, we just provided our city employees a really good raise, and we had the money to do so. 
we wouldn't have the money uh, if it wasn't for our, for our cannabis industry. So, so you know, I, I think it's important that the state has its regulations. I, I, I just, I am, uh, I'm just a little bit uh, concerned that ours are a little bit more restrictive and so we're tying their hands uh, already. And that is why the, the black market is, is making a comeback. It's making a comeback because we are just continue, we continue to regulate our cannabis industry. And with that, Sean just mentioned it, right? It's, it's unfortunately now being laced with fentanyl and we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of fentanyl that's un unfortunately, right? Uh, and so, you know, I, I think uh, for me as an elected official, I want to make sure that we are getting more money into our, into our, into our, 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 our budget. Uh, and so that's why I'm going to also continue to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to when cannabis retail shops open up in, in, in our commercial districts like downtown. Uh, we, I don't know if you noticed, but on, on, on Santa Clara Street, uh, the first retail, the cannabis retail shop is going to come in to one of many uh, empty vacant storefronts in downtown San Jose. So I'm super excited. I believe it's Purple Lotus. Um, it's going to be coming out what the old Pete's was, uh, and so I'm just uh, I just I want to make sure that our cannabis our legal cannabis industry is thriving and not our black market one, and that's why I'm I'm super supportive of of uh, my colleagues uh, memo, um, and so I hope that the the rest of the folks on this PISFIS committee can can vote to support Councilmember uh, uh, Jimenez's memo. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. We're going to go to Councilmember Batra. Thank you, Chair, for giving us the opportunity here. I got a question number one is, does the cannabis department do any enforcement or management of the unre um, the illegal, unapproved, unauthorized, business at all or your only responsibility is to work with the licensed operators? As Lee mentioned, we have to, if we have, if we are operating under a regulatory environment, we have to perform the work that, uh, you know, for the, that justifies the regulatory fee. So we do work with the regulated businesses. Um, but it is important to note that the state um, keeps um, amping up their enforcement. And so there is a state website and we refer um, any complaints that we get through, you know, the city's email system or I don't know what it's officially called for, um, for when people have concerns. And then um, anytime that our businesses bring up something or if they have some information about the businesses, we do refer all of those to the state they have an online tracking system. So we encourage anyone that has complaints to go to the state's website and fill it out because they do track it by address. And then again, if you get multiple complaints about the same address, they're more likely um, to go investigate. They allow you to make those complaints anonymously or you, can, or you can identify yourself. You can include as much information about the businesses that you have, include pictures or you know, screenshots of whatever that you have showing that there is an illegal business operating. So they, um, and they, we have worked, our, our uh, patrol has worked with the state when they've come in to investigate illegal businesses. Uh, we have dedicated a few officers for when they're in our city limits to investigate what they think is an illegal operation. So um, not the regulatory team, because again, we have to, we are funded by the regulated businesses, but we do coordinate that to ensure that it can happen, but we are not able to investigate those. So uh, thank you for that. Who do you, who does go and, is it anybody from the city involved in that? Or, uh, because I'm trying to learn this thing so that I can make my real point, which is, but I wanted to make sure that I'm using the right information. So I'm trying to figure out is, does your department have a responsibility to actually do something about the illegal unauthorized business happening or 
not. I am not able to decipher that at the moment. Yeah, we refer complaints also to code enforcement, so I think Rachel would be better suited to respond to what our city does because that's... No, uh, it does the, your department does. Yeah, our, our division does not, but... Yeah. but okay, so yeah. I think oh. that that's the answer I'm looking at. Okay, so what I see this memo and the whole discussion today, they're two separate items altogether. One is dealing with how to make the regulated cannabis business to work efficiently, properly, and them to pay the fair fees and not be burdened with such things that which make their operation impossible. So I think a lot of the stuff here about reducing the penalties and even item number three, A and B, relate to that area, making their operations more appropriate in our city because they are regulated and they are conducting their business fairly. Item number C, asking to expand responsibilities into, I think chairperson, I believe we have an issue of how to enforce things about the ones which are illegal, unauthorized business, but I'm not sure that our recommendation here or or the memo's recommendation to expand it. I think it should be an item which we should give it to the, uh, the city manager to come back with that our regulated business is getting hurt by this unregulated business, where and how we should really be doing some kind of enforcement so that our regulated business can continue to work. I'm not sure that we are in a position to recommend that it should be done by the cannabis regulation and expanding it to vape and smoke because it may need more than that. It may be that there are more places than that where this illegal activity happens. And hence, I think we should change 3C to something and give it to <laughs> our friendly city manager's office represented here and not give it to this department for regulation. Now, that would be my suggestion uh, and make our change accordingly because I think we need to do everything possible to help our regulated business work properly. I'm okay in reducing the fines. I'm okay in investigating their annual fee and all that. But I think this enforcement business, we need to take it somewhere. It is a big problem, and a city like San Jose should have a proper way of uh, managing that. Uh, that would be my suggestion. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. I, I, I have a few comments, obviously. Um, the first thing I would just say to all my colleagues up here is what we're doing in this memo is referring it to the full council, so there's going to be another, <laughs> I'm sure, much lengthier conversation. Um, where some of that can be worked out, we can have additional discussions. Um, uh, really, the spirit of, you know, because the topic of conversation has been 3C. <laughs> you know, the, the language is, you know, uh, it says direct staff to report back to PizFiz within the next three months, 90 days, on the following topics. And C is, as it's written, the possibility of expanding the scope of the Department of Cannabis regulations to include vape and smoke shops. I think the spirit of, what I wrote there is just simply the issue with the enforcement of the unregulated illegal actors in the market. I don't, I mean, it, as an example, if, if, you know, this, let's just say this direction holds, you go out in three months, bring it back, and you say, you know what, we actually think it's best if it resides in this other department. That's, that's fine, too. I just, I guess I'm trying to figure out how we fundamentally, because I think one of the main questions we have is, how do we fundamentally as a city address the illegal actors. Um, and I don't, I haven't quite seen, you know, I, I think Rachel and code, is for, code enforcement is, I think the, I often think code enforcement, the, the illegal businesses, right? Uh, and, and so anyway, so, so that, that was sort of the thinking around 3C. Um, I would also say that I, I think it's very, to me, it's a very true statement to say that the illegal market is quite literally impacting our city's bottom line. Mm -hmm quite literally, and I think that's the case yeah. for the operators as well, and that's why, 
you know, I've met with them and talked with them and heard different, you know, uh, ideas and thoughts, but that's the conclusion I've reached. And, and I'm not quite sure, I haven't quite quantified, and if, if anyone has the number, but quantified the amount of money they're foregoing in turn not paying in taxes. So how much money are we losing as a city because of illegal, oper illegal operations of this, in the smoke shops and vape shops and obviously the dude on the corner in the street, right, selling what he's selling. Uh, and so anyway, so that's what comes to mind for me and that's one of the main concerns I have uh, that's tied to, to, to C. Um, and, and so with regard to, um, it, before I go there, there was a question that was asked about a, an egregious violation Right, uh, and I think uh, Wendy, you said something along the lines of selling to kids under the age of whatever, uh, 21, um, or operating without a license. But what comes to mind for me as you were talking about that is we have egregious violations happening every every moment of the day via the illegal actors, right? And and it seems to me that we as a city haven't quite figured out how to capture that. Um, and, and so what came to mind as well is. So, for example, if there is a, uh, let's just say there is a smoke shop, vape shop, selling something that they're not supposed to be selling, <laughs> it, because cannabis is legal in the state of California, we're obviously, you know, uh, allowed the 16 operators here in the city of San Jose. If they're, if they're caught doing that, is, is that a civil or criminal penalty? I'm trying, to under, I'm trying to wrap my head around sort of what exactly, and maybe this is for Rachel, but, and I'm wondering if that distinction of what whatever that that um that 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 the fine or however we address that if that is what is challenging as it relates to who responds to this if that creates part I can, of the issue. i can try and respond to it Please. and then i don't know if tara has anything to add or, or others but um so so code enforcement does do enforcement we're just not proactive so as we receive complaints um or we find situations that warrant um, our enforcement efforts we will we will do that um that being said um the products that were discussed here today and, and those kinds of concerns we've been hearing about it just recently in the last few months it's been a topic that's been bubbling up because it it is something that not just san jose but many jurisdictions are seeing and so uh, for example the tobacco um coalition we meet with with the county it was on their agenda um not that long ago because we we're, we're as a county and city are trying to figure out how do we deal with this um as far as code enforcement's concerned we are only funded um for 20 percent of a position from the um regulatory um fees that are charged to the collectives and so that 20 percent of a position covers the inspections we do on operations and then the remaining um 80% of that cannabis position is for general funds. So they're responding to complaints for the community. But, but, but those complaint, those responses you're talking about are for the 16 operators. It's not, or you're not talking about the vape and smoke So 20% of the position is anything dealing with the, regulator, the regulated businesses. The other 80% of their time is spent on responding to complaints from the community of any sort. So we get complaints about people growing per, um, for personal use um, on their at their homes. We get complaints about um, businesses operating without a, um, a permit. Um, we've had seven complaints relating to um, businesses selling cannabis illegally in the city this, this uh, fiscal year. Um, okay. But we're complaint-based, we're not proactive, we're not staff right. we're proactive, it hasn't been the direction so, so, to do so, proactive. So uh, let's just say a vape, vape shop, smoke shop, you get a complaint, you go out there, you determine, okay, they did in fact sell to a minor, or they're selling and they're not supposed to be because they're not one of the 16th authorized sort of uh, dispensaries. What is what is the what is the process? What, what happens to them? Yes, yeah, so we can um, depending on what the violations are, we can issue a citation if it's in the citation um, fee fine schedule, or we can move forward with inspection, notice, and compliance. Sort of, we apply the same enforcement tools that we do any um, code enforcement case where they're in violation of the municipal code. I think you know, as part of the three C. Um, Part of your memo is, is, I think, one of the challenges with us needing additional time would be that we're just, there's probably scope that we're not even, there's aspects of the scope that we're not even aware of at this point and how, how, how big that would be to actually truly tackle this problem in the city. And so I think it does require coordination with us and PD, because there's a point where even us, our work, would um, our authority level would end, right? And others may need to participate. So, so, is it, so if someone, you get a report, you go out there, you determine they in fact did sell something that's, that they're not allowed to sell, it, 
I, I guess I'm trying to think through when PD gets involved as it relates to, oh, this is a criminal violation. If it's, if it's a criminal civil. infraction, they would be involved. Okay. So the sale of, uh, so uh, if a smoke shop is selling some of the items that were held up and saying they're, they're, they, they, they're not supposed to be selling this and they do, is that a criminal well, violation or is that a civil sort of? I'm trying to understand sort of. Well, we are too. We're, we're, that was part of the discussion at the county okay. was we're trying to understand what these products are and what's in these products and um, so on and so forth and how to regulate them. So, so, so if, if, if we had all the money in the world <laughs> and we determine what the scope water to me, would, would it just, I don't mean to simplify this, but would it just simply be an expansion of what you're already doing to all the vape and smoke shops to make sure that they're not selling product that they're not supposed to be selling? Is that is that a very simplistic way of thinking about it? You want to answer this one? Later? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think it's multi multifaceted. Um, so I I don't think Sean is wrong in in anything he said. Um, I'm also trying to walk a bit of a, a balancing act here, in the way of when there are criminal. Um, issues at these establishments, which I think we heard from Rachel, and I would agree listening um, to, to NSC and looking at the notes, as well as what I hear from PD, that there's illegal activity happening at some of these vape and smoke shops. Um, um, but I'm trying to not talk about that because there are things that we can do investigatory wise, not through a regulated you know, program around compliance. So I think that's a really big component of it, um, how we look at these businesses. Um, and then, council member, I just want to clear up one thing. Please. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I said please. Yeah, please. I was just going to say, I, I, I think 3C, the illegal activity happening at the vape and smoke shops, um, I think it's larger than them just selling cannabis at these places. There's a bunch of flavor, flavored tobacco that also has been laced with fentanyl and other drugs and has kids dying. So it is a larger concern than I think just the scope of this, which is why I asked for the flexibility. Um, I also don't want to hold up the other stuff. What the industry spoke to today, I think um, 3A and 3B, I don't even think you need to cross-reference those. As If you guys want those to come back to PISFIS, we can do those, and I think those are pretty straightforward and easy for us to do a lot less than 90 days. So I don't want to hold up that work because I think it's perfectly fine for us, uh, for you guys to direct, and for us to work with the industry on aligning to new standards. This is like an evolving industry, um, you know, that's rapidly changed over the course of the last few years. So it, it's totally fine for us to look at those things. I don't want to slow that up, but I do think to to the vape and smoke shops, this is an emerging thing that is um, bigger than just what we're talking about today. Um, that I think we do need time on because I think it is a possible uh there's a criminal track there's a regulatory track and and in all honesty it is it is a budget thing because as rachel's outlined where are those resources and and how we recommend priorities to you be spent on that it unfortunately does need to go through the budget process i appreciate that just one point of clarity the the three a three a and b i maybe I, the way i wrote it isn't clear but i didn't expect i mean that can certainly get cross-reference, but I was just hoping that would just be direction internally. It, absolutely. I don't, yeah. I don't think that's to be yeah. cross-reference. Okay. We're okay. happy to do that and we'll, we'll set up time with Sean and, and the other folks to talk about that. I mean, it's, it's public policy best practices report. So it's pretty straightforward for us to yeah. do. And, and so, so with regard to, so I understand there, there like everything has budgetary impacts. I, I realize that. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that if we actually resolve this, <laughs> It has a potential to bring in more money into the city, and so and so and so there are things that we often talk about, say audits, where if we address X, Y, and Z, it actually has budget positive budget budget implications. And so I think this is one of those where we we have a potential to knock out one the illegal activity and help address some of these issues, but at the same time and at the same time we're actually uh, bringing more money into the city. And so. I, I have no issue, like, you know, I just put 90 days just because I wanted to put some time frame on there. <laughs> it wasn't, it, 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 that was not a magic sort of uh, number. But my concern is that it's going to get sent away. We're not going to see it for a year. And then, and then it just magically reappears at some time. And, and I, it, we sort of lose track of it. And, and so that's what concerns me. Yeah, and um, that's not my intention at all. No. I mean, no, we, I totally we, we try and have you guys appropriate money through the budget process. And even at mid-year, which comes up, it's only 
emergency type items. Knowing where we're at with the council and where our general fund is, I think it would be difficult for you guys to be able to throw some general fund resources at this. But to your memorandum's point, and within Prop uh, 26, we have possible mechanisms to look at how we have fees or taxes towards those shops specifically. And that's why I asked for the budget process, not to stall yeah. for next year or even the following year. It's those would be things we would look at so that you guys have those policy choices so that you're not making a decision between enforcement um, around criminal activity or non-compliance around vape and smoke shops versus say homelessness, but that you have special dedicated fees where you can focus on those things. Yeah, I totally understand. I guess, I guess as it relates to the budget, I guess my thinking around it is that in order to know what the budgetary implications are gonna be with whatever road we decide to go down, I feel like we need this information, right? And that, that's, a, that's why I'm asking for it. And so I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, so I, I'm open to, you know, more time that's that's cool with me uh, and i suspect you know we're all logical well-meaning folks and so i just don't know what what that i'm trying to understand what that looks like like when would we get an update as it relates to yeah and again um I'll, as soon as this meeting's over i'll spend some time with deputy chief jimenez um and the chief as well as chris burton um but again i think we would want this to have this ready for you before you start prioritization of the budget process. So I think you know we can tentatively schedule it in for January or February of you know piss fizz before we really jump into that if you'd so like or you can direct us to do a manager's budget addendum yeah, or, and, or, and report back. Or, or how about that? Maybe that maybe that's a better approach. So so see maybe you know January you all bring it back bring item C specifically back, and if you bring back A and B, great, uh, but bring item C, make sure that comes back, just to touch base and see where you are and see what you've uncovered at this point, and then we can figure it out from there. Yeah, that's that'd be okay. fine. Is that okay? Okay. And then please. please. Chair Jimenez, just want to make one comment. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. This is a regulatory body, so they kind of deal with regulation of cannabis business, but what we're talking about is sales of fentanyl and marijuana to juveniles. That's, that's a police issue, and we'll have that's a crime so we want to leave this meeting knowing that if that's occurring report that to the police and we'll we'll handle that through law enforcement enforcement techniques whether we use special operations or patrol but if that's occurring that's the way we'll handle that we won't handle that through um uh this body however the sergeant is there so if anybody knows about anything occurring please let the sergeant know and the sergeant will report that to whatever department in the bureau so that we can make sure that we handle that because we do not want the sales of illicit drugs to, to juveniles. So I just wanted to answer your question. I, appre I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and hey, I think uh, Councilmember Rabatra had a comment. Just a point of clarification. Oh, I, I want to misspeak. Uh, apparently we do not have a January PISFIS meeting as I've uh, just been instructed. So it would be February. Yeah. <laughs> or December. I mean, whatever you guys want. <laughs> Kid, I, I'm kidding. Yeah, we'll do it on the 25th. That, that's fine. That's, that's fine. Yeah. If we can I, touch on this then and let me let us let us know the committee know where we are and we'll go from there. I, I have my hand raised. I think that's fair. Yes, sorry about that. Let me, uh, I'm going to go to Vice Mayor. So th those are all the comments I had. So I appreciate the motion. So we'll go to Vice Mayor Kamei. Sure. She had her hand raised and then Should we'll uh, go that, another that's round. Or, that's yeah. fine. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Sorry. Uh, th thank you so much. Um, I guess, you know, I'm not going to repeat anything that you've already uh, mentioned. I just want to emphasize the urgency of uh, really circling back on uh, what's happening in the, the vape and smoke shops. Um, I think that uh, when this comes back, November 14th, uh, to the council, they're going to have the same question. So my recommendation would be that uh, let us know as soon as possible, probably at that November 14th meeting, uh, when we would have some kind of framework to deal with this because there's a tremendous urgency to it. I know that in uh, Chair Jimenez's uh, memo, he said 90 days, you're gonna have the same discussions on November 14th. So I would, I would encourage the staff to, you know, kind of huddle together and, and you know, kind of like think about how that's going to be responded to because there is a tremendous urgency in our community. 
And um, I know that, you know, there's time needed to do this correctly and go through the budget process for the, for the, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the resources. Um, but I think that there's some answers that are going to need to be made on November 14th. So I would, I would highly suggest that whatever you can find out, whatever it is that the staff needs, however it is that, you know, when it comes to council, that you have some responses, because uh, I think that you'll have similar discussions with a, with the full council. So that's just my, my, my take on it. You know, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Chair Jimenez's memo. I think that I understand needing more time to, you know, figure this out. Uh, but I also think that there are some things that are just not going to wait. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd hate to think that, oh, well, you know, it'll come, you know, next year and, you know, through the budget process, that's, you know, March, and then you have to wait when the budget gets, you know, done in June and, you know, nothing happens. Um, I, I want to say that's just too slow. That is just too slow. So um, maybe we have to move priorities and say, okay, this is a higher priority than something else and let the council weigh those priorities. Um, so I just wanted to give that input. Thank you. Lee, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, you know, with respect to the vice mayor's comments, may, maybe it is better if the full item does get cross-referenced to the full council. Um, I think you guys um, have asked us to be very focused. Um, I'm looking at a memo from last week for the Neighborhood Services Education Committee, which two of you are on, that has a pretty extensive work plan for code enforcement around flavored tobacco and uh, nitrous oxide. So again, it is the council's prerogative to shift priorities, um, but I, I don't believe I'm in a position to ask people to do more with less. So maybe the whole item should be referenced um, because I think at this point we have contrary priorities from different committees and, and I don't know how to reconcile those other than have you guys make that decision. And I would say that that's totally appropriate. Okay, I, I have some thoughts, but we'll go to Councilmember Batra. He's been actually before you go. Yeah. Was that it, Council uh, Vice Mayor Kamei? Was there anything yes, else? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're no, thank, thank Cal you, Councilmember Batra. Okay, all right. So I think before the Vice Mayor spoke, uh, we heard the comment from Lee that this thing is. We wrote, or your memo wrote, the vape and the smoke. But this problem of enforcement of illegal business is a little bit more than that. And what it should be, the, what the scope should be and all that, isn't really stated. This is a reactionary item to what we know happens to be. Maybe it is 50% of the business, maybe 60% of the business. So I was going to suggest that we take this item out of here, make separate 3A and 3B. Those are run of the mill activity. We should leave that with your 90 day requirement. Take C into a separate item altogether and that should be a full investigation of the total, total exploration of what we need to do with the, um, with the enforcement of the illegal business, the scope of that one, and whether those should be smoke shops and all. We already got the response from the police that if there's a fentanyl or anything which is happening, which is a criminal activities, that should be enforced right now and it doesn't need any research at this point in time. So let's not try to confuse the priority based on that, that yes, we need to take care of the fentanyl, so hence, the smoke shop should be done at the same time. Let's go after the fentanyl and other activity aggressively because we have the rules for that. This one, I think we should let the full scope be developed and then we implement that so that we take care of this thing once for all, not keep building it up in increments of uh, 
half inch of uh, half the rules. So that would be my suggestion to take it out from this thing and put it in with a longer time duration and a bigger scope than just these two areas. We're saying it, uh, maybe we can take care of the thing. So it doesn't look to me to be the right place for it. Thank you. Thank you, I'll just take the privilege as a chair just to say a few things. So, so I think what we already talked about is keeping 3A, 3B within the committee and then the recognizing that it's probably gonna take a little bit more time um, to, to, to bring back some information related to the expansion of the scope, the exploration, because I think that's inherent in what you're saying is exploring and figuring out what, and that's exactly what C calls for, and that's why I think if it comes back after, in February, I think that's, that, that's okay too, and I think that probably addresses some of your, um, and, then, and then there was a comment about maybe um, cross-referencing the whole thing, um, I, I think that's fine. I, I just think that you know these committees are, are created to do some of this work before it bubbles up to the full council, and so that's why I thought 3A and 3B would be good to actually do some work, get some information here internally before we cross-reference, and so that's the only thing that comes to mind as it relates to. Can Can I jump in and just thing. clarify Please. something really quickly? I I think that for 3C particularly, it would be good to cross-reference it to the whole council, as that wasn't on the agenda today. It's a broadening of the scope of what we're even talking about, so it might be best that at least that one go to the full council. I think that's that's reasonable, and and then you know we can have that conversation. So 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 just so I understand, then, and the maker of the motion can let me know if he understands it to be the same way. Is <laughs> staff recommendations moving forward, which I'm supportive of. I think it's great, um, along with the memo, um, and then cross referencing it. Uh, and then item three is, is uh, asking staff to come back to the PISFIS committee, 3A and 3B, and then 3C gets cross-referenced to the full council. And I think what's gonna happen, I think the natural course of things is that this memo that was written, it's gonna be attached to the stuff that goes up to the full council as it relates to this anyway, right? So I think folks are gonna see, yeah. Uh, and so, anyway, so, but I think Vice Mayor is right in that there's gonna, I think, <laughs> You're seeing the tip of the iceberg, if you will, as it relates to, I think, the interest in this topic, and I suspect that there's gonna be a very robust conversation at the full council about what to do, and, and I appreciate the fact that the city has consistently done a lot with very little as far as the employees, and, and I appreciate your comments, Lee. I just, again, part of the exploration that I was hoping for is to, to see if things that we're already doing, we can just sort of lace this in with that. And that's, that's, I'm not sure if that would work, but that was some of the information that I hope to discover and learn about as this comes forward. So I'll stop talking. We have Council Member Torres that uh, had his button pushed, but if you wanna. I, I accept the uh, amended. Um, Is that okay with the comment. seconder? Yes. Okay, I, I think we've exhausted the heck out of this. And so um, there's no more comments. Uh, so I think we have a motion on the floor. If we take a vote, please. Batra? Yes. Torres? Yes. Kame? Yes, and I'm alone. Duan? Yes. And Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience with us. Okay. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to our next item, which I suspect is equally as uh, meaty and is gonna spark some conversation. Uh, that is item four. Response to the investigation of police misconduct in San Jose reported by Moil Law and Fukuri, LLP. Uh, and we have a host of folks. I know Lee's gonna be uh, uh, speaking. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sununu Tauri is here. Uh, Chief uh, Mata, Deputy Police Chief Jaime Jimenez, Police Lieutenant uh, Internal Affairs Max Zuniga, uh, uh, Lieutenant Paul Hamlin, uh, Assistant Director of Employment Relations, Allison Suggs. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to everyone joining us for this presentation. So we're here today to talk about the MLF report, which recommends a new model for police oversight in San Jose. I um, want to welcome uh, our acting IPA, who will be helping with the presentation. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. This presentation will be in two sections. Um, we're going to start by kind of outlining the MLF report and how we got here, and then 
outline the recommendations as well as the policy alternatives um, that staff has identified for consideration by the committee. The MLF report was initiated in August of 2020 when the council directed the city manager and IPA to provide council with recommendations for how the IPA um, would, uh, would take over investigations of police misconduct from the San Jose Police Department's Internal Affairs Unit. The city manager and IPA returned to council in March of 2021 with a full work plan to implement this direction. The work plan proposed uh, bringing on a consultant to develop key recommendations for a uh, revised police oversight model for consideration by the full council. After council approved that work, uh, staff uh, initiated that process with a one of uh, three RFPs that was posted in March of 2021. That RFP received only one response. Uh, so the city and IPA uh, decided to repost and do additional outreach to potential bidders. That second RFP posting received only four responses. And after evaluating these responses, it was determined by the city manager and independent police auditor to go back out for a third time to receive more robust responses. Final RFP was issued in January of 2022, and the RFP results um, were more positive this time with the city and IPA selecting MLF in June of 2021. I do want to give some context for these procurements. Uh, during this time period, many other cities and counties were procuring consulting services around police reform topics over the course um, of, of 2020 as well as 2021. Even us as a city, San Jose, we had multiple procurements underway around police oversight, whether it be this, um, or the use of force, or our after and action, or after action reports or, um, specific to the 2020 civil unrest in San Jose. In part due to this high demand, uh, the RFP process became uh, challenging to say the least as finding a, a suitable consultant, um, which is why the delay in the process. However, MLF did complete the report in November of 2022 last year, and the city manager and IPA presented this um, presented this to the full council in December of last year. Council directed staff to return to the Public Safety Finance Strategic Support Committee with an analysis of the MLF recommendations and to provide an implementation framework. There we go. The MLF report analyzes the advantages and disadvantages of three potential models. First is our own model, which we'll refer to as the internal affairs model. Under this model, police misconduct is investigated by the internal affairs unit within the department. This is San Jose's uh, current approach to police oversight. It also analyzed the civilian oversight model, which under that model, police misconduct, or I should say all police misconduct, is conducted by civilians who are independent of the police department. And lastly, it reported on and analyzed a hybrid model in which some misconduct investigations would be conducted by the Internal Affairs Unit and within the police department, while others would be conducted by independent civilian investigations. MLF ultimately recommended this hybrid approach given where San Jose was out, noting that it combined the advantages of both models. It retained, by retaining <laughs> investigations within an Internal Affairs, it leveraged training, experience, and knowledge that sworn police officers had uh, related to use of misconduct in investigations, yet at the same time, it brought in, by bringing in civilian investigators, it also enhanced the independence of investiga investigation processes. There we go. Under our current model, well, this slide, Decide, or, uh, attempts to uh, show the differences between our model and this hybrid model. Under our model, Internal Affairs does investigate mis, uh, police misconduct and the IPA audits those, rec or those investigations to ensure that they are complete, thorough, <coughs> objective, and, and fair. Specifically as part of this work, the IPA 
gives input regarding the allegations to be investigated, can participate in all investigative interviews, third, request additional witnesses to be interviewed, and has access to all recordings and documents which make up the investigation. However, under the hybrid model, which is recommended in the report, the IPA would take responsibility for conducting a portion of the police misconduct investigations themselves. The report recommends that three investigators be added to the IPA's office to perform this role. Internal affairs would continue, uh, would also continue to conduct, or, uh, conduct investigations, and the internal affairs or the police department and the IB, uh, independent police auditor would have to coordinate uh, and come up with a framework on how complaints would be received and determine which entity would ultimately investigate that complaint. As part of council's direction, staff has put together an implementation framework or work plan. Um, if the council ultimately wishes to pursue this hybrid model, it's important to note that the city would need to meet and confer with the San Jose Police Officers Association before taking any initial steps um, or before the IPA would be able to begin investigating police misconduct. Uh, at this time, I can't predict how long that process would take, but we estimate that it could take from anywhere from seven months to a year. Um, and while some of these uh, work streams can, can happen in parallel, um, it's difficult to say um, through the meet and confer process, but also the budgetary process um, when this would be implemented. The city manager and independent police auditor have also collaborated to consider uh, developing policy alternatives for council's consideration, which was also part of the direction um, from December of 2022. Uh, the council directed us to take a comprehensive analysis of the report um, and implementation, consider and implementation considerations um, around the various alternatives around process improvements and staffing. We've developed the following, and for the most part, these alternatives uh, could be implemented without going through a meet and confer process, um, which would result in faster implementation. And many of these are born directly from the MLF report. These are process improvements that could be implemented under the city's current oversight model and uh, do not require full implementation of the hybrid model. The first of these recommendations is recommendation 11 from the MLF report, which recommends that the IPA be given unfettered access to any documents related to uh, the incident that is being investigated. The administration agrees with this recommendation um, and has worked with the IPA uh, to, in coordination of this recommendation and it's been implemented. The second recommendation is recommendation seven from the MLF report and it recommends that the Internal Affairs Unit and IPA coordinate closely on ensuring uh, joint operating procedures. Both the administration and IPA agree that close alignment and coordination around standard operating procedures is essential and are committed to continue improving these joint processes. These efforts would involve ensuring that these joint processes are documented both in IA uh, um, guide, uh, unit guidelines as well as the IPA procedure manual. Third, and recommendation number two from the report, recommends taking steps to reduce turnover in the IPA uh, to ensure the, conti the uh, in ensuring the continuity of operations. Sorry, I've never actually seen the time delay, but this, my computer's telling me that I've, I'm past my 10 minutes, so. Yeah, you better speed it up. <laughs> yeah. gonna, yeah. Sorry, Lee, can I okay. interrupt? It actually the turnover is not for IPA. Yes, for uh, IA. just to, yes. I was just about to correct myself. Yes. So the recommendation two recommends taking steps to reduce turnover in the Internal Affairs Unit, uh, helping ensure continuity of its operations. So to that end, the department has proposed that we establish a two-year minimum for officers, sergeants, and the lieutenant Internal Affairs. I will say, unlike the other three recommendations on this slide, this recommendation would trigger a meet and confer requirement with the San Jose Police Officers Association. And finally, recommendation four of the MLF report recommends that both the IPA and internal affairs undertake regular community 
outreach efforts to increase community understanding of the investigative process. Both agree um, and will coordinate on development of outreach to inform the public around this topic for future policy considerations. In addition to process improvements, the administration and IPA have collaborated to develop recommendations on how oversight resources could be increased to enhance the capacity and independence of our oversight efforts. We've developed these for both the Office of uh, the Independent Police Auditor as well as internal or uh, our own city manager's office, and I'll turn it over to Karen to walk through the recommendations for her part. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to uh, preface my comments by saying I um, am a, a real fan of the current system that San Jose has in place. The, the role of a true auditor means so much to the community and to the police department. Um, over the years, there have been many positive policy changes, and um, this is, if we move away from the model we have, I fear that we would need an auditor for the auditor. Um, I believe the tools that the IPA office have are extremely strong complete access to all the videos, to all the documents. And the, and the strongest tool we have is the ability to attend the interviews of officers or officer witnesses who are being questioned. That tool is as good as investigation. Unfortunately, the office is not currently fully staffed to attend every interview. And many times we have missed I'd say more than 50% of the time, we miss the opportunity to attend those interviews and do robust auditing. So that's why we're making um, this policy recommendation um, along with supporting the idea of the Office of Employee Relations handling some more investigations for the department. That's all. Thank you. Um, in addition to increased staffing in the independent police auditor's office, uh, we've developed an option for adding staff within the city manager's office of employee relations. One of the, as I'll, I'll refer to office employee relations as OER, one of its core missions is to in investigate allegations of misconduct against city employees. In this capacity, o um, OER already takes responsibility for a limited number of misconduct investigations of sworn police personnel under the current model. Under this proposal, we'd be adding two positions in that office that would be devoted to conducting investigations of misconduct within the police department. As part of the city manager's office of employee relations, it is staffed by civilians and is independent of the police department's command structure. As such, adding staff to o OER for the purpose of increasing the number of investigations of police officers that it conduct um, would be a means of increasing civilian oversight of the department if desired. Unlike the hybrid model uh, recommended by MLF, this approach would not require the city to meet and confer with the San Jose Police Officers Association as it is currently a function of OER already and takes place. I would say that with these additional staff, OER would take a greater role in police department investigations into alleged misconduct uh, that, if true, would be a violation of city administrative policy or other investigations deemed appropriate by the city manager, the director of employee relations, and the police chief. Uh, given that uh, this office is not staffed by sworn personnel or personnel with policing expertise, it would not conduct any investigations that require detailed knowledge of police tactics such as use of force. This slide, uh, this slide shows uh, the direction um, to pursue the hybrid model uh, work plan as well as alternatives identified in the report. If council wishes to pursue the hybrid model, the next steps would be to direct staff to meet and confer with the Police Officers Association uh, for other process improvements related to process or resources, 
staff would come forward as part of the mayor's or uh, before the mayor's March budget message or through manager's budget addendum or the proposed budget process to outline those resources for council consideration within the context of the overall budget. With that, staff does recommend that you accept the report and uh, cross-reference to the full council. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate it. We're going to go to public comment first, and then we'll come back to the committee. We have three public speaker cards. Can Catherine, Sean, and Greg Adam make their way down? Uh, please line up along the steps in front of the podium. One speaker will walk down at a time and have two minutes to speak, and please state your name for the record. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, com uh, committee members. Sorry, I'm Sergeant Alvarez with um, the San Jose Police Department. I'm the Vice President of the San Jose Police Officers Association and I've been at the San Jose Police Department for 25 years now. I currently work in the, as a field training sergeant uh, for field operations in the Foothill Division. The POA have submit submitted two letters to council opposing the proposal to eliminate our internal affairs unit and turn over investigations of alleged misconduct to a private coordinator. I strongly request consideration of the legal obstacles and that this proposal is based on misleading data that our letters um, and my colleagues will address right now. Uh, the 25 years that I've been here at the San Jose Police Department, I've seen the steady progress, progression of the San Jose Police Department is made in regards of how we manage our mental health crisis situations uh, the Mercury News has chosen, unfortunately, to cherry pick data to fit a preconceived narrative that mental, our mental health crisis intervention training has been ineffective. And as a field training sergeant, this is far from the truth. I've seen firsthand experience of our new officers and this kind of cherry picking data has been demoralizing to our patrol officers. <clears throat> as Chief Mata has disclosed in his op-ed yesterday, since rolling out CIT in 2017, use of force in cases involving um, an involuntary mental health hold dropped 91%. Force when subjects have any mental health issue dropped 22%, and a total use of force declined 13%. In 2001, San Jose PD rolled out our mobile crisis um, assessment team, it's called MCAT, and consisting of officers with advanced crisis training they responded to 3,465 mental health calls instead of a beat officer and focused on de-escalation and working closely with case managers to connect those in crisis. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Sean Pritchard. I'm the recent former president of the uh, POA. We had recently learned the uh, former IPA had skewed the numbers in her end of year report. And it was apparent the merits of the investigations and personal, personal toll these investigations have on the lives and reputations of police officers were of no concern, but rather the pursuit of a political agenda. This is a very shameful practice. This practice has the effect of dramatically increasing the number of clothes with concern or disagreed with findings when in fact the former IPA may not have even bothered to review those files. This begs the question, how long has the IPA's office been misleading the city council? Was this the IPA's standard operating procedure? Since the previous IPA did not rely on any established policies or procedures, the council should retain an independent investigator to review past IPA year-end reports. Remove the automatic close for concern and disagreed with categories described above. And issue revised, accurate, and honest versions of them. Based on a policy decision that would eliminate the current IPA model based upon this misleading data would be political malpractice in disservice to the men and women who make up the San Jose PD. It would send the wrong message at a time we are struggling to keep and recruit officers. We do not support the elimination of our internal affairs unit. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. I just wanna add that the practice of close as disagree or close of concern based on procedures been eliminated. 
Uh, good afternoon, committee members. My name is Greg Adam, I'm counsel for the POA. And as Vice President Alvarez said, we uh, wrote a couple of letters. I wrote to the council on June 5th explaining all of the legal flaws with the former IPA's position and the former mayor's position that the charter allows the IPA to conduct investigations. It does not. And MLF recognized in their first version of the report that it is not. Um, in fact, the charter has never allowed the IPA to do direct investigations of police officers. The, the IPA's powers are delineated in the charter and they do not list investigations. Now, the former IPA and the former mayor made the argument that, that Measure G, which we, the POA, came together with the city to negotiate in 2020, they argued that that allows it. It doesn't. There's nothing in the language of Measure G that allows uh, the IPA to conduct negotiations. Measure G did several things. In fact, the current um, IPA commented on them by opening up access to participation in interviews, to providing more information to the IPA to strengthen the IPA's role. But not only was it not agreed in Measure G that the uh, IPA could do investigations, the city never even proposed it. And because Measure G is, a, is the product of labor negotiations, what was agreed in those labor negotiations will control what Measure G means. So the one thing that wasn't covered in the, the PowerPoint is that the charter just does not allow the IPA to do direct investigations of police officers. It would require a charter change. Thank you. Thank you, and now on to Zoom. Isa. Hello, my name is Issa Achloni, community leader in South San Jose. San Jose Police Department has not been placed under a federal mandated consent decree. Why? Because San Jose PD has been doing a good job in keeping their officers in check, and when an officer is out of check, it's dealt with swiftly. Why try to fix something that isn't broken? I had a personal experience with the SJPD officer that concerned me. I met with internal affairs and was recorded and told all my concerns. And within six months, the SJPD officer was removed from the city. For those reasons and many more, I'm asking for no change to the current policy. I agree with Karen Sununu and what she stated. But if you don't feel comfortable with that, I'm asking for a policy alternative option. Thank you for your time. Call in user number two. Good afternoon. I'm Sergeant Steve Slack, and I've just assumed the role of president of the POA. I work in the Family Violence Unit. I've been with San Jose PD for 27 years. In police work, it's essential that I objectively assess the facts before me, investigate leads, interview witnesses, victims, and pour over every bit of evidence prior to making or not making an arrest. It's the right and only thing to do as a police officer if you're working in an investigatory role. I cannot rely upon faulty, inaccurate data or facts to make an arrest decision. You guys should not rely upon faulty and inaccurate facts or data to make a policy decision. I urge the members of this committee, as well as the entire city council, to engage in the same objective and deliberative process to evaluate the elimination of our internal affairs unit and contracting it out to a private entity to conduct alleged misconduct investigations. Put quite simply, the data does not support a gutting of our current IPA model to appease vocal, defund, and anti-police fringe groups. During the recent presentation to council, the 22 IPA year-end report, IPA Sununu Tauri disclosed that one of the key components of this report was, quote, misleading. Ms. Sununu Tauri was being very diplomatic there. What the previous IPA did was more than misleading. In our opinion, it's a deliberate and calculated act to falsify a police re or public report and hoodwink this council into acting rashly based upon faulty data. IPA Sununu Tauri disclosed that the previous IPA often pre-assigned a disagreed or closed with concerns designation to cases that she hadn't even bothered to actually review that were submitted to her by the Internal Affairs Unit. I am glad to hear that those designations are gone. Up to 30% of all those cases included in the 2022 year-end report were subject to this egregious and unethical practice. Under state law, an alleged misconduct allegation must be adjudicated within a 365-day statute of limitations. 
It was revealed that if the previous IPA received a case within 45 days of that statute, she would designate the case as closed with concerns. Zoom caller, Samsung SMA. Uh, yes, what's concerning to me is that the police department is designed to protect the people. That's its basic function. Whatever tools are going to be necessary in order for the public to accomplish that goal in facilitating the ability for the police to protect us from dirty racist cops. That's the issue. There's some dirty cops that don't belong as cops. And I'm surprised that the police department and the POA are trying to push back on a mechanism that would ensure dirty cops would be released from your ranks. It sounds to me like you wanna protect them. It sounds to me like you wanna protect your reputation at the cost of the citizen. That means you have nullified your own oath, which means to protect the people. I don't like Karen Sununu. I don't like any prosecutor that stood there and supported the three strikes were outlaw and sending people to prison for having a bag of dope, for stealing a DVD player from Target. So I don't trust her either. I don't like her and I don't want her there. What we need is we had we have a mechanism that worked and it was the police review board that was headed, spearheaded by La Senora Sophie Mendoza. We already have what works and what functions and what holds the police department accountable. Now I liken Chief Mata to Chief McNamara because McNamara was doing the same thing. He erred on the side of making sure that the public had direct oversight. I don't like any of these. The IPA is a failure, the POA is a failure, the internal affairs are a failure. We need a civilian review board to check both of you. Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, my work with you know uh, tech tech accountability with the ACLU it, it brought me to ideas that you know ACLU works on ideas of uh, a lot of issues it includes whistleblower protection for police officers and that led me to the ideas of uh, counseling services for police for police officers that are available that uh, came into four after the George Floyd things. Uh, those two items, I think, are important that I, I hope as police, uh, as this sort of item, we can talk about more as a place of uh, safety, you know, for police to be able to talk to each other about issues. And uh, it can help a lot, I feel. Uh, good luck in, in continuing the efforts of counseling services and good whistleblower protections. It actually works to invite a whole inclusive department process to invest to address internal investigation things and such, making it an easier process and not a uh, haunting, uh, intimidating process, uh, accusatory process. With that all said, um, I liked the previous IPA. She had been there since 2010, like previous 2010. So, I mean, think of the people who were working as IPAs before 2010. It's quite possible uh, Siobhan was like simply practicing what was kind of a standard accepted practices of the IPA for decades now. Um, so I, she was a good bureaucrat. So I, I, I don't want to hold it too much against her and what I'm understanding. Uh, but with that said, you know, uh, with this item, uh, we had a really good IPA, Walter Katz. And at that time, he was fighting hard to continue the P IPA. Yet there was a, a major surge that a community that wanted public oversight. And it was a good group uh, d developing this subject. From what Paul has said, uh, I think we really have to be addressing the concepts of public oversight for the future. And this, this board to review things is a good start, but it's public oversight of community. That's what's key. Thank you. Rev Rowan. Unmute. Hi, I'm the Reverend Rowan Fairgrove. I'm part of the Pact Beloved Community Team, and we have worked with the IPA's office for many years trying to get the word out to the community about this important office. I really think it's very important that there be some oversight of the police that's not internal to the police, and I hope we don't lose sight of that. Thank you. Back to the committee. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Councilmember Batra first, please. Thank you for that uh, information, options. Uh, you have presented to us and the report which has been written. I need a couple of clarifications about the current process. Um, I may have mentioned this before. When I came on the council, this was one of the items I wanted to look into detail because public has to have trust in our police force and our processes for doing the work. And as a result, I had a lot of discussions about this thing with Chief Mara, but please help me understand. Today, when internal investigations are done, are the IPA allowed to be in the interviews as an observer or is able to ask any questions? We're invited to every interview and allowed to ask questions. Okay. So, and also, there was a concern which was expressed to me about the internal investigation looks at whatever the charges or the misconduct reports might be, or only yeah, IA decides that, and the IPA gets to see the results of that one whenever their investigation is complete. And, and the IPA, sometimes it may be too late, for IPA to be able to make some meaningful suggestion. Uh, could you clarify when does the IPA get involved with the internal affairs? Um, we're involved almost immediately. The complaints can come two ways, one through internal affairs or one through the Office of the Independent Police Auditor. IA, Internal Affairs, looks at all the complaints that come through our office, and we look at all the complaints that come through their office. They do the investigation, but at the front end of the investigation, we are allowed to give input into what the allegations should be which make up the investigation. This is an amazing tool that we have. The Internal Affairs sends my office the body-worn camera. They say, we're thinking of these allegations. We review the footage and have a discussion with them. So we are allowed to give input as to what the allegations are at the front end of the investigation. Thank you. May I add something as well, IP? I don't know if you agree, but also, Mr. Bacho, when- Get closer to the <laughs> I'm not talking loud enough. When the investigation is complete, prior to it being closed, the investigation is also reshared with the IPA so they can take a second look at it before it either goes to finding a recommendation or it gets closed. So at that point, the IPA can make additional comments before the case moves forward to closure. And then at closure, there's an appeal process if we don't agree with it. So this is rigorous auditing and rigorous accounting to the public. So it's, it's collaborative, it's observable throughout the time, and it's all open. That's correct. And one of the suggestions made if council accepts the policy recommendation is that we sit down and have a standard operating procedure with IA. That has never been done, and it's, it would be very important for understanding between the two offices and for the public to see exactly what the standard operating procedure is. And I'm sorry to report, the Office of IPA does not have standard operating procedures, and I've assured the public and council that that's something I want to see happen. Yeah, so, so I think what your observation is that our current process, bulk of it is designed to work right. Some elements have not been pursued and, and some of them have not even been properly clarified that how this should be working, but like the, you don't have the procedures, uh, mutually agreed procedures to do it. So I believe that the having investigators on top of investigators and investigators on top of investigators 
is not a very effective way of doing business anywhere, whether in private industry, whether in city government, or in police department. I think the process which is there, we need to make sure that this is fully defined and that has been vetted by the people who really are experts at it. And then it is rigorously followed and, and the results are known. I think there is a policy, uh, the process improvement uh, or re-evaluation needed. I don't believe that we need at this point in time to, especially knowing from Chief Mata, how concerned he is in terms of trying to self-discipline his force so that they deliver to the public what the public is expected to have, a proper police force protecting the public and doing it fairly and properly. So based on that one, I don't see a change of the so-called hybrid model needed because the hybrid model is trying to do something a little different, but really doesn't seem to be making a phenomenal difference which will cause us to have any more faith in that system. We believe that the current system should be properly documented, should be well known that how it is working and done, how the IA and the uh, IPA are collaborating in this stuff, and where can the public and when the public can see any of the information about the investigation. Uh, and, and I think that's the level of improvement we need, but we do not need to throw away a working process which may need a little tweak in favor of something which is not likely to produce any better result. So I, uh, Chair, I'd like to, like to move that we, we improve the current process and not change the policy alternative where we are trying to go for the hybrid model. Okay, um, so just the point of clarification, Lee. So, so we're, the, the, the action that's before us is accept the report responding to the investigation of police misconduct, for that report that we've referenced, cross-referencing it to the city council for the November 14th meeting. Um, Councilman Rubatra is adding, you know, his perspective as it relates to what model to take or not take. Uh, we can do yeah. that's absolutely the, okay, cool. the recommendation language does give the committee flexibility to also make a recommendation to the full council, but the full council would need to decide this. Okay, absolutely. Okay. So is that motion okay? That motion is perfectly fine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There a second. So, so my motion was to not accept the um, the recommendation of the hybrid model, which is recommended by the uh, consultants, uh, mm -hmm. and work on the po the policy improvements, uh, which was, I believe, the first one is that we are we have the internal process, uh, the current process improvement. So, so I, I would like to clarify this. So what your motion is to reject the staff memorandum and keep the current model the same, keeping internal affairs as is? Correct. Okay. Stay with the status quo, effectively. Is In that case, I'll second. So was that, was that your intent, that, essentially state of the status quo? And, current, uh, yes. Okay. All right, okay. All right, that's a motion and a second. All right, we're gonna go on to uh, Council Member Torres. Mr. Chair, did, did, you, did we wanna get Vice Mayor to make first? Yeah, my apologies. Vice Mayor, uh, I, I don't know if you have your hand raised, but if you do, here's an opportunity to speak if you're ready. Okay, um, I, um, I did have some comments. You know, I, I think that we are sort of at a, at a point where uh, it's probably uh, not advisable to make a lot of changes simply because of, you know, the different learnings that we've sort of un unveiled and so I uh, would agree with the current motion that we probably want to maintain what is in existence and be able to improve uh, processes. Um, I was surprised that there are no processes in place. I mean, you know, not that there's nothing, but, but that there needs to be uh, better procedures 
um, and uh, clearer, clearer understanding. So uh, I would agree with the motion. Is uh, anything else, uh, Vice Mayor? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. So thank you. Uh, we're going to go now to Councilmember Torres. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a, a few questions. I'm not sure who can answer these, but th th one of them is clarifying. I saw in the presentation $150,000 plus $600,000 uh, when we, if, if this policy recommendation goes forth. Was, was that correct? $150,000 and $600,000, or is that just $600,000 total? I believe it is both, but those would come forward as part of the budget process next year for your consideration. Okay, great. <clears throat> and then the other one is, and I know that the, 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 the lawyer from the POA mentioned this. I, the IPA was founded via a chart, a vote, right? A uh, public, a, pub, a ballot box vote, long, long time ago, right? Um, and so, if, and it's starting, I don't know how it's gonna align right now, but um, for us to move this policy forward, that is, I'm assuming, it's just the city council or does it have to go? Because I thought in our city, when we change the charter, it has to go to the ballot box. The, the policy, well, Lee should answer, but it doesn't change the charter. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna say Tara should answer that. <laughs> yeah, because that's where I'm a little bit confused on. Okay, okay, let me get a little bit of clarification. Are you talking about if the council were to move forward the recommendation from the consultant? or the recommendation from staff? The recommendation from the consultant. Okay. The hybrid the, would change the charter, so hence it has to go to a ballot box, correct? Well, our office is aware of that issue, and we're still diving into it a bit. We, we would, we're, we're looking into it, we'll have an answer in time for the council meeting. Okay. And then the other one is our own our own IPA believes that we should maintain the, the full model and just make sure that we keep uh, continuing to, to hire staff. Is, is that correct? Yes, I think the current model is, uh, and I've looked at models throughout the United States, this is a fabulous, robust auditing model but I'm asking, I, and I will be asking council to strengthen it by adding an auditor so they, that we can ensure our presence at all interviews. But not, I'm not asking to change the current model. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then fully, I think this is more for um, Mr. Mr. Chair, my colleague, Sergio. So for the... When we, ne when, we ne when we next have a police bi-monthly report, I'm wondering if we can take a deeper dive uh, into our MCAT, because I know our MCAT is doing uh, incredible work when it comes to uh, mental health and uh, addiction uh, behavioral. So if we can take a deeper dive uh, for the police bi-monthly, that'd be great. Yeah, I would say I'll work with Lee Wilcox, city manager's office, to figure out how we can plug that into the, yeah. to the work. We're happy to do that. Not a, not a problem. Great. And, 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 to, and to be quite frank, as a, as a, we have seen our IPA come and go, right? We have a temporary one now. And so uh, as, a, a, as a, an elected official, I don't feel comfortable creating policy right now uh, without steadfast leadership. So we definitely do need to hire a new IPA that will have consistent staff. And so we know that it's important to, to root out problematic officers in our department. And as a former youth activist, no longer a youth, it's 40 something years ago, a city hall employee, an elected official, I know that many of our police officers show up to serve our community with, with dignity and respect. But as a brown man that has been pulled over more than a few times with family members that are brown and black and have been pulled over time and time again, and our community 
our community does have mistrust of, of our SJPD. But moving forward with no concrete leadership and staff, it would be a disservice to our IPA, SJPD, and our community um, if we move this policy forward. So I do agree with the motion that, uh, at the, on the table. So thank you. Thank you so much. We have uh, Council Member Duan. Thank you, Chair. Anyone can answer this question. How many other city within the county or within the state of California has the IPA do all the investigation? Anyone? Council member, I apologize. I don't have that answer, so I wouldn't be able to give you that answer now, but we'll look into it. We'll, we'll look at like cities and, and get you an answer if you'd like. Um, I, I don't know of another city that ha has, in California, that has an independent, I mean, this is the office of the independent police auditor, not the independent police investigator. So I don't, I don't know of a city that has given that job to an auditor. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, Go ahead. I just want to ask Peter Hamilton, who's probably most familiar with the report, or at least more familiar than I am, but I, I know page 20 of the report talks about other jurisdictions. Did MLF do any best practices to kind of distinguish between their recommendations and what other cities do? Uh, yes, uh, Peter Hamilton, uh, assistant to the city manager. Uh, if um, you look at page 66 in the report, it's Appendix B. It has a list of um, other jurisdictions and some fairly detailed descriptions of their models. Um, I would say that most of the models, it's other, other large cities, not only in California, but across the country. Um, I would say most of the models uh, included here are um, some version of a hybrid model where you have uh, both civilians and officers and police um, both doing investigations, although there are a number of different configurations. Uh, the one that MLF recommended in their report is probably most similar to the uh, BART police model, which has an IA uh, that does investigations and an IPA that also does investigations. So it's, I would say most of them are like that, although the the particular structure and configuration can vary from city to city. Thank you for that answer. And if my understanding is correct, the San Jose Police Department, and just like any other department, including the fire department and, and any of our department within the city, there, there will always be people who make mistakes or they need to, you know, performance improvement plan and so on. But I believe that San Jose Police Department, with 368,000 calls and only 360-something complaints, right, or at least violation, I think the amount is, is it's much smaller than, than any other metropolitan. And I'm not saying that they're perfect in any ways. I think there's always room for improvement. But as a public servant, we are human, and there will be mistakes. And some of those mistakes may be large, and some of those mistakes may be small. But we got to remember, if we expect per perfection, it will never happen. So again, I just want to make sure that we understand the amount of complaints that the police department get is 0 0.001 of a percent. And, and I believe that there's always room for improvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're gonna go back to Council Member Batra. Anxious to say something, let's see what he says. Very quick comment, I wanna make. Here we are talking about the procedures, processes, how we need to audit the things. What I want to make comment on is that our police force puts their life on the line every day to protect us. Most, if not all, all the time, come with that goal when they get out of their bed to protect the people. And 
seeing my interaction with the chief mata he wants to have a highest standard police force in the world he wants to self discipline if there is any issues with the help of the ipa work done properly i think we can have the confidence that san jose has the right kind of police force and has the right procedure to detect if there are any violations and discipline those so with that confidence i have made that motion to keep the procedure strengthen it where appropriate but do not try to mess with the procedure okay i don't see any more comments vice mayor any parting words no okay uh, no i think no okay thank you uh, i would just say that uh, i'm in i'm very i'm very much looking forward to the extended conversation i'm sure we're going to have at the full council um i agree with much of what was said about our police department uh, and all that and certainly support the police department i'm not sure this is the best route to go but i'll, I'll reserve my comments for the full council meeting but uh, but i appreciate everyone's comments and so with that i think uh, we're going to take a vote batra yes torres yes kame yes and i'm alone duan and Jimenez. No. Okay, so that is the end of the agenda. We're gonna to go to open forum. Do we have any public comment? Uh, Samsung. Uh, yesterday, while riding a bike on San Carlos Street, a car intentionally went into the bike lane with the intention to kill me. Reason why I know that is because I caught up to the car. And when I got to the car and I cut him off and he was sitting there in traffic, he threatened me with the, with the child inside the car. He said specifically, next time I see you on the street, I'm gonna hit you with my car and I'm gonna kill you. Now I can go to the police department right now and you know what will happen? Absolutely nothing, nothing. I can report that I got a picture of the person I got a picture of the license plate. You guys will get that and you'll toss it in the trash can because that's how my, much my life means to this city. On numerous occasions, there have been, I'm also being surveilled. I have uh, footage of the, of the uh, drones that were following me ever since I was at Horseshoe Park. Now, the, that's all they do is they just hover and they locate wh where's this person? What are they doing? It's got camera capability to look at because uh, it can magnify to look at your phone. Now, these are facts. I have the footage. It's not a delusion. Once again, won't be followed up. So what does it take for my city to protect me? Or does the city have an intention to cooperate through its silence? to have me killed because of the effectiveness of my advocacy. I'm, put, I'm gonna continue putting the city on notice so the in the event that my life is taken prematurely by the intention of someone on the streets and you fail to protect me, I'm gonna make sure that my family has a legacy and they're able to sue the city for millions of dollars who are put on. Where? Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, as the South Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area has spent the past 100 plus years developing the future of technology and communication for the world, this has also been based on an important simple balance of responsible good practices and how to better consider human beings and human society in hopeful, reasonable, intelligent good terms. From this good intentions of the past 100 plus years, I hope San Jose can learn how to continue their own decades long good practices as a good mediator and facilitator for the South Bay. It is from this, I hope San Jose will continue the efforts to more openly talk about and work towards the ideas of human rights, civil rights, civil protections, openness, accountability, and community participation as how to talk about the future of community technology, surveillance, and data collection. These are simply the ways to address more genuinely positive, responsible, long-term concepts of our community sustainability. 
This is a good formula that we need to learn to better address and to better practice from our school age to our regular lives and community and government and as elders. It teaches responsibility and good civics lessons and that it offers skills in how to be prepared to better address the inventiveness of future tech itself. These are already very familiar good ideas and practices that will simply have to be uh, spoken to more often and more openly in our lives in San Jose and the South Bay uh, in the future. By San Jose city government and community wanting to practice these ideas together now, it will eventually attract the AI businesses San Jose is looking for who want to share the same values of responsibility, openness, and accountability. We need to learn to trust. We can openly talk about responsibility, openness, accountability with our tech. Among its many good practices is how to better lead ourselves to the important new concepts and directions of how to consider commerce and economy based on our ideas of peace and better reasoning and cooperation before war and profit. Thank you. Back to the committee. Okay, meeting's adjourned. Thank you.